Hood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. So welcome. Welcome to the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington. We ask you now to text MORAL okay. to 90975 or go to June2020.org.
people of all races and creeds and colors and religions and ages and genders and sexualities. People are committing to building a moral fusion movement and building power. Everybody say, oh! I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. This movement is not about merely saving the Democratic Party or criticizing the Republican Party. This movement is about saving the soul of this nation. We are rising up to fight poverty, not the poor. stand here and claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and be silent about the moral outrage that is going on in our country. New Jersey! We are not afraid. We will stand for liberty. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you, we love you. Thank you, we love you. And any nation that ignores half of its people is in a moral and economic crisis. Almost 57 years ago, my father, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., reminded America of the fierce urgency of now. That now is not the time to engage in the luxury of cooling off, nor take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. But now is the time to make real the promises of this democracy. He was working with poor people of every race from every corner of this nation to build a poor people's campaign when he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, five years later. Today, as his daughter, I am honored to add my voice to the poor people's campaign, a national call for moral revival and stand with the 140 million poor people and low wealth people urging America to address with the fierce urgency of now the big issues of poverty and race. Please join us in this movement. There is a coming together of people all across this nation, a fusion movement shaping the narrative that lifts up the 140 million poor people living in poverty in America. Welcome, America, to this coming together. Welcome to the Digital Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, a movement that is bringing together black, brown, white people, liberals and conservatives, the young and our elders, gay, straight, trans, queer people, religious and non-religious people, people of all backgrounds and all walks of life to fight the injustice of poverty and the injustices that grow out of poverty. I am the Reverend Nancy Petty, pastor of Pullen Memorial Baptist Church here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where we come to you live this morning with the Poor People's Campaign. I am part of the Poor People's Campaign and past chair of the Board of Repairs of the Breach. I am honored this day to stand with the Reverend Alan Jackson and welcome the nation and the world to this historic day. Our purpose this day resounds the message of the moral fusion message of the 19th century Reconstruction and the message of the 1968 
Poor People's Campaign, Economic Justice for Poor People. In the words of Dr. King, we have come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood and sisterhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. So welcome. Welcome to the Mass Poor People's Assembly and March on Washington. We ask you now to text MORAL 90975 or go to june2020.org. Thank you, Pastor Petty. I'm proud to stand with you today welcoming the nation and the world to this digital justice gathering. I'm Alvin O'Neill Jackson, Executive Director of the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington. Today, we will hear from the prophets of our time, not just those who stand in churches, inside the walls of churches and mosques and synagogues and temples and upon high elevated podiums, but prophets who struggle to survive in food deserts and who scream and shout and march and protest on city streets. Prophets among the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, prophets, prophets are human, but they hear, uh, they, they sound an octave a bit too high for our ears. They have experiences that defy our understanding. They are neither moralizing poets nor singing saints, but assaulters of the mind. Their words often begin where our conscience ends. Today, we will hear from the prophets of our time. Hear them. Listen. Listen. But first, we will have a word and litany from faith leaders, followed by a video, the pain and picture of poverty. And after the song, What Doth the Lord Require by Ms. Yara Allen, the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, and the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II will speak to us. We come with many names for the holy. God, Allah, its spirit, Brahman, and those too sacred to voice. Though we come called by different teachers, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Moses, Guru Nanak, and others. We declare in the face of systemic racism, silence is betrayal. We affirm the voice of each human that within each person is endowed these rights and recognitions. Racism is the virus that tears at our humanity, infects our systems, and festers within the great democratic experiment that is America. Somebody's hurting our people, and it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. A pandemic magnifies the fissures created by racist capitalism where essential workers are really sacrificial and not given the essentials they need. For the nearly 700 people who died every day from poverty in this country before, before the, the virus. virus. We pray that we would not be comforted by the false worship of broken systems. But instead we would find a new way. Create among us an economy of interdependence. Somebody's hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. As we cut at earth, we hurt the spirit of river, soil, mountain, and tree. There is enough for everyone to live free. But there is not enough for corporate greed. We pray with our policy demands, with solidarity strikes, with movements for farmers and growers. For public health workers. For indigenous struggle, for sacred land. For mothers fighting for water. 
Somebody's hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. We lament a nation addicted to war, economically dependent on violence, foreign and domestic. We can't fully address the suffering of God's people. If we continue to spend half of our national budget on the military, lining the pockets of corporations and billionaires, and sacrificing the lives of our young people, let us study war no more. Somebody's hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. For the labor and witness of those who have gone before us, to light the way forward. With thanksgiving in our heart, we remember the shoulders on which we stand. And those who laid the foundation for this movement. For those who dreamed us to this moment. And this movement. For Sojourner Truth. Frederick Douglass. John Brown. Harriet Tubman. Lucretia Mott. Sitting Bull. For A. Philip Randolph, Fannie Lou Hamer. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. Ella Baker. Dorothy Day. Abraham Heschel. Cesar Chavez. Baynard Rustin and Pauli Murray. For the elders still with us, for the children birthed in this movement now. We pray, Holy One, and ones of infinite name and reach. Thank you for the courage of our people in the streets today. Lifted up to organize in our communities today. And we, like the ones before, are now the ones we've been waiting for. And we won't be silent, 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 silent anymore. anymore anymore we lament because we love we prophesy and stand for prophetic witness because we love we advocate for justice because we love we speak painful truths because we love because we love our fellow human children of God because we love this creation that God has given us and because we love, we must stand up for what is right. Because we love, we must stand up for what is good. Because we love, we stand up for what is just. Because we love, we stand up for what is not selfish, but sacrificial. Because we love, we march. Because we love, we call on our leaders to help us to make America, America a shining city on a hill and not a place of darkness and despair. Let love lead us. Let love guide us. Let love show us the way. Shall we pray? Great God, love is not only what you do, it is who you are. The scripture says, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He or she who loves not knows not God, for God is love. You've taught us, God, that there is no fear in love and that love casts out fear. The greatest commandment is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And as my grandmother used to say often, love is not a say word. Love is a do word. Help us to live lives filled with love. Amen and praise God. At one time, poverty was a temporary condition. You were on a down slope for a minute, but you could bounce back up. We can't bounce back up today. It's permanent. We're not going back to the factory and building cars and trucks like we once did. A job working at McDonald's or the grocery store doesn't pay enough for one person to live. We work a 40-hour work week, still not enough. Living from paycheck to paycheck. Rent is $600 a month. We got water bill, electricity. I do this for my kids. And it, and it hurts. We were in the height of mass water shutoffs. This entire neighborhood um, was shut off all at one time. I saw all my neighbors get shut off right in front of me. It was kind of terrifying. I'm 42 years old, and I'm a cashier at McDonald's. I had lost my house. You're welcome to come inside. 
there's a lot of people that are living in their cars. You never notice until you're in the same situation. I don't have stuff to give my children. Mm -hmm. I'm paying all these bills, and they need school clothes and stuff. They be asking me for I can't give it to them. I see poverty in my own community. You know, there's a 70% unemployment rate in my in the reservation right now. Here in New York City, we're home to millionaires and billionaires, and we have so many people living in the street, and that's just not right. I've been a homeless veteran twice, uh, lived in a shelter. I've been living down here since I was 17. I'm from Flint, Michigan. You can't imagine being in my footsteps. I have children who have never had the experience of drinking from the tap. 700,000 people in this country are on the verge of losing their food stamps. This budget calls for shrinking the social safety net programs like Medicare. I just know that everything that's happening to us isn't right. I'm in stage five of kidney disease. I fell behind on my health care, and they canceled my health insurance, and they told me uh, I have to wait until open enrollment. There's only five stages of kidney disease, and I'm in the fifth stage. Murder, it's murder. You know, if you ask me, it's murder. I lost a son to gun violence, and I lost a daughter. No parents should have, in America, should have to bury their, their child for a lack of medical expense. My car. Oh, no more. My car. My car, Kevin. I'm well. I'm well, y'all. Well, I'm well. Cause my babies ain't no more. How many more babies? How many more children? No more. What does the Lord require of thee? What does
We are gathered today to call for a radical redistribution of political and economic power, a revolution of moral values, to demonstrate the power of poor and impacted people banding together, demanding that this country change for the better. We are rising together in this digital mass poor people's assembly and moral march on Washington. And we thank you for gathering with us. My name is the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are a moral fusion movement of the poor and activists and all of those who will not stand by as 700 people die every day from poverty and inequality in this, the richest country in the world, who must come together, organize together, demand justice together in the face of systemic racism and police violence, the climate crisis and the militarization of our communities, who believe to the very depths of our being that we can save the planet, demilitarize our world, and actually abolish systemic racism and systemic poverty for all. We're here because people are being abandoned in the midst of abundance. People are being murdered by the police. People are being denied health care while the wealthy profit off of a pandemic and many of the richest corporations in the world are paying essential workers expendable wages. We are here because there is a war on the poor at home and abroad, because people are being forced to choose between rent and medicine and food. We're here because we have to be. Somebody's been hurting our people. It's gone on far too long. And we can't, we won't be silent anymore. We're here to lift up the truth of our nation, to put faces on immense just injustice, to mourn in public so as to shock this nation's conscience, and to show where our hope for change really is. Hope, you see, comes from the bottom, from those most directly impacted by profound evils in America today, coming together and building power. We know that bold, revolutionary, systemic change is only possible when we have a powerful movement to right these wrongs. And these kinds of movements, just, movements don't just happen. We are called to be. 
we are called to build them. Those in power today want nothing more than to stop this kind of movement. It's why they spend so much time and money trying to deny, deny us the right to vote, why they attack protesters, why they spread lies meant to narrow our vision, limit our aspirations, divide us by issue and by region, by race, gender, immigration status, political party. But today, we're here to demonstrate that we're here. We're poor. We're not going anywhere. We have come together. We will stay together. We will transform this nation from the bottom up. To join the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Please text the word moral to 90975. A movement is rising up. Forward together, not one step back. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. And I'm Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, and also with repairers of the breach. Today, we are gathering, and my primary words are going to come at the end when I try to sound a call to action after you have heard the voices of what Dr. Jackson called the prophets. Now, this rally, this digital rally, this mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, the stage is being given to people who are impacted, people who are poor and low wealth, who are impacted by systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. They will give their stories because we're going to put a face on this, this reality of poverty, a face you might not normally think of, a counterintuitive face. So you'll hear from a coal miner from Kentucky, but you'll also hear from somebody from the Delta of Mississippi and, and somebody from up north in Maine and over to California and Arizona. We're putting a face and a voice on the 140 million poor and low wealth people. That is important, not just to have people pontificate on behalf of the poor, but to allow the people who are impacted to speak to this nation because you change the narrative by changing the narrators and by putting a face on it so it's not just numbers. And when we talk about 700 people dying a day, you can see a face. And so today is really about the people, the people, those prophets Dr. Jackson talked about, hearing their voices. And we want you to go get somebody. Tell them to join in. Go to www.june2020.org. We have over 200 Facebook live streamings that are going on right now, and over 100,000 people, plus 150,000 people who RSVP'd. Go get somebody else and join them, because we believe if you see these faces and hear these voices, you'll join this movement, and you'll understand why America has to face this issue that's impacting 43% of the people in this country, 140 million people. There's a second reason, though, we're here today, because today, even as I'm speaking now, it's just gone live, and it will go to every congressperson, every senator, both presidential candidates, governors and legislatures, the Poor People's Moral Justice Jubilee Policy Platform. Because we understand that a movement must not only have moral articulation, but you must have a moral agenda. We have put an agenda together. We have found the money. We've had people work with the best economists, the best sociologists, and, the be and impacted people, putting a budget together. And our platform is five principles, everybody in, nobody out. When you lift from the bottom, everybody rises. Prioritize the leadership of the poor, low income, and most impacted. Debts that cannot be paid must be relieved, and we need a moral revolution of values to repair the breach in our land. We have a com comprehensive, and somebody asked us one time, they said, well, what one or two things do you want? And our response was, well, in the pandemic, the corporations got two and a half to three trillion things. Don't limit poor people. Don't limit the low income. We want what is required. We want what is 
what is supposed to be. The Bible says in Isaiah 10, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. And then the third thing is we're building power. We're building power. I'll talk about some of this at the end, but you need to know that the number of poor and low wealth people in this country who have not voted because they don't hear poverty talked about on the political stages and they don't hear it talked about in the debates. But the number of them that have not voted far outweigh the margins of any candidate's victory. Poor and low wealth people, as Dr. King told us in 1965 on the steps of the Alabama State House, hold the key to fully transforming the political calculus in this country. So we've come today that you might hear from the people. We've come today that we might present a platform, a real platform, that addresses how we address the issues of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And we have come to say it's not only time to change the narrative, it's not only time to put a face on it, it's time to be a power, to be a power among poor and low wealth people and we won't be silent anymore. We want you now to hear, as people will introduce, the first up is Danny Glover, who will be introducing and then others will come. I'll leave that to Reverend Petty and Reverend Jackson, but stay with us all, stay with us and hear these voices. I declare your mind will be changed, your heart will be touched, and you'll be a part, you'll want to join in and transform this nation. God bless you. Hello, I'm Danny Glover, and I'm a part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Did you know there are 140 million people in this country who are poor, or one emergency away from being poor, even before COVID-19 hit? Hi, I'm Gene. I know this is a challenging time for so many of our sisters and brothers. Millions have lost their jobs, have lost their health care. Meanwhile, just three billionaires have the same wealth as half the country. So we can't be silent anymore about poverty. That's why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign, this national call for moral revival. It's time to hear from these 140 million people and see the faces behind the numbers. My name is Christine Riccio. I lived here in South Carolina since 1997. Poverty and homelessness have been a part of my life story since I was 10 years old. Um, we were short $160 for the rent one month. We asked the, uh, the landlord for extension for three days, and the next thing we know, we got eviction notice. So we moved downtown, um, downtown Charleston to Meeting on Lee Street, where we bought another tent to live in. and. Uh, Prayed that the walls wouldn't shake too bad when the wind blew. Mm. Mm. We had to beg businesses to use their bathroom. Um, when you never had to be hungry, the people in Washington were sending war machines to other countries mm -hmm. to build war against others mm -hmm. instead of homes for people here or medical for people here or food for people here for children that are sleeping in their cars. Right. that don't have, that go to bed hungry at night. Hi, my name is Pamela Roach. I'm from Lyons County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. Sorry. <laughs> they charged me over $114,000 on a mobile home. They're falling apart and then I'll Animal coming in my house, possum, that trap, that trap, uh, four possum in my house, cats and stuff, and I got raw sewage. I don't have no no money on pump, mm -hmm. and I have to travel back and forth to buy my hand to for, take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have my car and don't have no way to, to take her. And then we have a high utility bill. And I, pay, I was paying like $370 a month on the trailer. My name is Mary 
Mary Jane Shanklin, RN, and I'm a proud Kansas farmer's wife. My husband, Mark, is a fourth generation dry land farmer. We live in a 129 year old farmhouse with barely adequate electricity and barely adequate plumbing. We live in a food desert. There is only one grocery store in our county. We live in a news desert. <clears throat> we have no hospital in our county. And it, the nearest one is 30 minutes away at 70 miles an hour. And Kansas farmers are at a breaking point because economic stress and polluted groundwater are killing them. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in Kansas. A lot of it is due to the fertilizer and pesticide runoff in the water. We didn't get city water until 1984 on the farm. Before that, it was pond and stream water treated with chlorine. Almost everyone we know has a cancer story. And Kansas farmers' suicide rate is 85 deaths per 100,000, which is higher than our veterans' suicide rate. And it has shot up since 2017, when world grain markets were destabilized by tariffs. Farmers live in an invisible poverty and a silent desperation as foreclosures loom and the blame for being the one who lost the family farm hangs over them every single day. Pacoima is really important to all of us. Many of us who are here come from this community, including myself, and so it's important when we hear things like one out of every four students in Telfair is homeless, that means something. It's more than a number. That means that there's children and families who are going without, and that's not right. The homelessness that you're seeing in streets of LA, in our community, you can see it in Fresno, you can see it in Sacramento, you can see it in Salinas, you can see it in Chico, you can see it all up and down the state. People encamped in the streets, living in their cars, in RVs, in garages. It's a growing phenomenon. And one thing that's important for me to point out, I don't think this is because people just don't know how to manage their finances. This is an economic devastation based on a systemic root. We're all tied to that root. My name is Olivia Williams. I work at Starbucks in the Orlando International Airport. My coworkers and I began organizing a union because we were frustrated about the disrespect from the host management. I'm 24 years old and I was hospitalized twice in two years from workplace incidents. The pandemic made things worse. We had no training on how to protect ourselves or the public. I speak up and I told them that management only started paying attention to us when we started fighting for the union. I'm not afraid to fight. I've been fighting all my life. I was born with cerebral palsy, and my parents were told I would never walk or talk. Instead, I graduated high school at the top of my class. HMS host underestimates me and my coworkers. But working people like us are strong and powerful when we come together. This is why we demand an historical investment in resources to end the pandemic of poverty in the midst of plenty. Repeal of the 2017 tax breaks for the wealthy, relief from poverty and wealth inequality. I'm tired of watching my friends die in the streets. Everyone has the right to affordable housing and living wages. And that's why I work with the Poor People's Campaign a national call for a moral revival. Hi, I'm Wanda. Did you know that women and children are on the front lines of poverty? That's why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign. I'm not poor, but I'm a woman, and I have children, and I care. Did you know that women make up two-thirds of the workforce consistently in the lowest paying jobs? Three quarters of the people in the United States of America who are poor are women and children. Most of women's care work goes unpaid. It's time to hear from them. My name is Amy Jo Hutchison and I come from West Virginia. I think as I look back on my life, I'm 46 years old and I've never spent a day in my life without poverty on some level. 
I had Medicaid, and so without any notice, DHHR sent me a letter. They told me I had to send a form in in February. So this is April when I get the letter. And by the time I received the letter, I had just a couple of days' notice that I no longer have health insurance. So please tell me, as a poor person, what I'm supposed to do. I have a bachelor's degree. I'm trying to heal a medical condition now with essential oils and prayers. While I work full time, I take my kids to the softball games. I'm doing everything that I can. I'm organizing around other poor people, predominantly low-income moms. And so I just don't think that we should have to give this much of ourselves right. in order to have a good quality of life in America, the richest country in the world. My name is Nicole Hill, and I just want to tell a little bit about my story about being a poor person in the city of Detroit. Um, you are constantly raped by corporate greed. I lived without my water, uh, with it being cut off um, the first time in May of 2014. It was off for two months. No matter how poor they are, they're always helping somebody else. And that's why, despite what's going on with Donald Trump, what's going on in this country, we are going to win. You know, I'm confident in that. I believe in that. I believe in that. I really do. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Reverend Annie Chambers. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a welfare rights, one of the women that helped started welfare rights many years ago. And we're still around and we're still fighting. Dr. King came to welfare rights and asked us to help. <coughs> to help start, help the Pope People's Campaign so that we can get started. And we agreed. But we said to Dr. King before then now, Dr. King, where was you when they locked us up? And we was out there fighting for food stamps. You, you know, we couldn't, we sent you a letter, but you didn't respond. And he didn't. He said, yeah, but I'm here now. And I heard about y'all ladies, and I want to be with y'all. So we went back. To, and that's when food stamps came about. This is why we demand living wages, a care income, a guaranteed income, with equal pay for equal work. You know, honestly, in this moment, I'm just grieving. I'm just grieving and, and, and mourning and wailing. And it's for these reasons and more that I'm a part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Poverty is a form of trauma for our children and their families. If you have to go to school hungry, Without enough food, you can't learn and you don't do as well in school. If you're concerned about where you're going to live from one day to the next, if you don't feel well, but you can't go to the doctor, all of these things have a generational impact on our children. Our children are struggling. They're growing up in poverty. That's why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Did you know that nearly 39 million children in this nation are poor or living in low-income families? Did you know that 1.5 million children in the public school system are homeless? And one in five children are hungry. It's time to hear from these young people. I'm a first-generation student, a food service worker, and a queer person born and raised in Knox County, Kentucky. I could tell you about collecting firewood when we didn't ha have electric or collecting rainwater in buckets when we couldn't get water. Or how scared my mom was using SNAP in public because of the way people talked about it, like us being hungry was shameful. Yeah. Uh, 
Fridays, even though she was working overtime every week. Mm. I used a gym membership to shower regularly and spent 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., then 5 p.m. to midnight shifts over the summers to save for an apartment and bills at gas stations and uh, sports bars, just anywhere that would give me hours, really, and would sit in McDonald's parking lots uh, for Wi-Fi just so I could finish homework. Um, My name is Jada Rackard. I'm from Boston, Mass., and I'm 10 years old and I'm going into the sixth grade. We are a mile away from not one, not two, but three meth methadone clinics. Some of us see people walking up and down the street. I see people walking like zombies, like from a movie, and almost falling down, and it scares me. So if you ask me what I'm fighting for, I'm fighting for my life and my community. How are you fighting for us? Thank you. Our third child was born seven weeks early. The only thing my family knew was a beautiful addition to our family. Adriel, Adriel's deaf, blind, and developmentally disabled. As he begun to have medical hurdles to overcome, we flew into action. My husband and I are dedicated parents. We would provide and support our children so they could thrive. Adriel would be no different. And on that day, we were firmly launched into the shadows. In the shadows are hundreds and thousands of marginalized people and families. In 2016, it was reported the unemployment rate for those who experience a disability is 64.1% in this country. As a young person living in Harlan County, um, I think a lot of times our voices are put down. A lot of people around here um, don't really realize the issues that are going on. And um, I think that it's time that we as a people, educate the people that don't know what's going, on, what's going on in their communities. It's time that we show our elected officials, our state legislators, what's going on. And that us young people know what they're doing. That us young people and us as the people are going to rise above and that we will not lay silent no more. Hi, my name is Sophia Caruso and I am a student in the New York City Public Schools. This is why we demand free quality public education, housing for all, food and water for all. No more war. We demand health care. Hi, it's Deborah Messing. Our LGBTQ communities face high risks of poverty and violence. That's why I'm here today as part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Did you know that LGBTQ plus youth represent 20 to 40 percent of the homeless youth population? That transgender individuals and communities experience shocking amounts of violence and discrimination? Did you know that LGBTQ immigrants are 15 times more likely to experience sexual assault in confinement? This violence against LGBTQ communities must end. Well, family, it's time now that we hear from them. My name is Sophia Helena Maestatreet, uh, and I served for 10 years in the U.S. Navy and then the U.S. Coast Guard. When I was discharged from the Coast Guard for being transgender, I was put out into the world with no training, no preparation, and there was no consideration what can happen to a transgender woman with no job and no skills. Is it any wonder why so many of us live in poverty? And for what? So an aerospace company 
continue to raise their valuation by a tenth of a percent while their aircraft fall out of the air or just flat out refuse to fly and their missiles destroy the lives of innocent people who yes. were unfortunate enough to stand next to somebody we considered an enemy. Yes. My name is Curtis and I am a poor white gay Christian from the Tenderloin. Uh, I actually live in a single room occupancy room, that's SRO. I was sick and homeless, alone, and I was an addict. Now, I wasn't homeless because I was an addict. I was an addict because I was homeless and alone. I had been denied my social security despite being hospitalized, get this, 12 times in two years, and I was way too sick to work. I was here in San Francisco because I had fled the homophobia and the hate that I encountered elsewhere and the stigma of AIDS that had made me an outcast. I had to win a city lottery to get housing. At age 55, I finally have health insurance for the very first time in my entire life. Can you imagine? First time. I've watched the police come by and take all of the people's belongings and force them to move on even though they got nowhere else to go. And when I was homeless, I experienced that firsthand. See, the war on the poor in this country, it seeks to blame the poor people for their circumstances. It wanted me to believe that I was the problem, that my illness was my fault, a moral failing on my part, that if I was a better person, I wouldn't be in these circumstances. And the sad part is, they almost had me believe in that. I was almost ready to give up, but I'm lucky. I'm still here despite the odds, and I no longer buy into that narrative that poverty is my fault. All right. This is why we demand equity and safety for all persons, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation. We demand housing for all, a just immigration system, an end to incarceration, deportation, and detention. This is why I'm in the Poor People's Campaign, and we won't be silent anymore. My name is Laurel Ashton, and I'm the organizing director with Repairs of the Breach and the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And my name is Reverend Erica Williams, and I am co-director of the Moral Fusion Student Organizing Fellowship Program. As y'all have already seen, we are in a moral crisis a crisis that began before this pandemic. But thankfully, people around this country are organizing. Speakers that you have heard are organizing in their communities. And right now, there are tens of thousands of you tuning in from around the world. And we need you. We need you to help build the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a more revival. We are bringing people together from all across this world, from different races, genders, sexualities, to build this powerful movement. And we need you to take the next step. So we're asking you to go to june2020.org or text MORO90975 to join this movement as we build this powerful movement of a nonviolent army of justice, love, and peace. Coming up, you're going to hear from people impacted by poverty wages from Kentucky to Missouri to DC. You're going to hear from essential workers who are leaders in their local unions. Now we'll hear an interview on the cost of inequality. Joe, you've been writing about this for years. Uh, the folks doing today's event have been talking about it for years and working at it for years, but we are in a moment now between the coronavirus pandemic and the great social upheaval that we've got, where it seems that the, the awareness of many Americans has been heightened and they are understanding what in, how inequality manifests in the lives of, of poor people, disadvantaged people. Do you think that we are in a good moment to take th this opportunity and affect meaningful change? Yes, I do. You know, we are a rich country with poor people. <laughs> it makes absolutely uh, no sense. And the pandemic has brought this out so clearly. Um, it, it's not an equal opportunity virus. And 
we've made this odd decision. The things that we care about a lot, our children, our elderly, our sick, we say, we don't want to spend any money on them. Hmm. We don't want to pay the people who care for our elderly and our sick and our, uh, our children. We don't want to pay them a decent wage. Uh, to me, I find that uh, completely uh, beyond reason. And we don't want to go back to the economy that we had in January and February 2020. We want to go to a new kind of economy, one in which uh, it's a knowledge economy, it's a more equal economy, and it's a greener economy. Hi, I'm Reverend Rodney Williams. The bottom 80% of our country has not realized a rise in their income in the last 50 years. And although people are calling low-wage workers essential, they are treated as if they are expendable. Did you know that 60 million people in our country earn less than a living wage? They're working one, two, or three jobs and still can't pay their bills. Most low-wage workers are women and women of color. And on top of that, 40 million working people have lost their jobs in just the past two months during this pandemic. This is a movement of fairness and it is a movement of equality. I've seen the power of this movement change the consciousness of America. It's time to hear from these workers. In 1969, we as nurses aide, we had the DCIB, we had to help cut down trach, we did everything on the emergency card. So we were tired, sick and tired of being overworked and underpaid. All we want was a little bit of money for the hard work that we done. We didn't get that. Instead, we got jailed. We got put in jail, we got whipped, we got beat. I got kicked out of my house, I was down on the projects. They kicked me out of my house. I didn't have any place to go. But yeah. we cannot stop here. Yeah. We got to fight on for what is right. We working for underwages back in 69. You're doing the same thing in 2019. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to stand still and let it happen to us all over again? To be whipped, put in jail? For what? Because we feel like we deserve more money for the hard work we have done. Let's pass the torch. Yeah. Let's don't leave it where it's at. Yeah. We started in 69, we can finish in 2019. I'm with y'all all the way. Let's fight for justice. My name is Terrence Wise, and I'm a 37-year-old second-generation fast food worker. I'm a leader in the Fight for 15 movement here in Kansas City, and I'm also a father of three girls. I currently work at McDonald's, and despite my many years of experience, I only make $9 an hour. But my fiance Mo is a home health care worker and a Walmart worker. She works doubly hard. And despite her 13 years as a home health care worker, she only makes $10 an hour, taking care of some of the most vulnerable citizens in this nation. Neither Mo nor I, neither one of us, have benefits, a pension, paid time off, no voice on the job whatsoever. It means that me, I haven't been to see a doctor or a dentist in 18 years. 18 years. It means that my daughters, my three little girls, have memories of getting ready for school in the back of our purple minivan in sub-freezing temperatures right here in Kansas City while me and Mo get ready for work in the front seat because we are homeless. Y'all, when Mo got sick earlier this year, just this year, and she was in and out of the hospital, our employers didn't care if we became homeless again. They didn't care because we don't have paid time off, sick pay, insurance. They didn't care if Mo lived or died. And that's the truth. And that's what poverty wages and no unions look like in the world's richest nation. I've been a union member since 1968. I have black lung. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. We got an old saying in the coal mines, it's rough at the face. Well, where I live in southeastern Kentucky, it's rough at the face. In that area, 
hasn't gotten better. It's worse today than it's ever been. See, it took me seven years going to see doctor after doctor after doctor to get a settlement on my black lung. My name is Jamila Allen. I live in Durham and I work at Freddy's where I serve customers and train other employees. Freddy's is a multi-million dollar company and I earn $8 an hour and that's a poverty wage. The largest employers in the U.S. like McDonald's and Walmart are paying $7.25 an hour. $7.25 an hour to millions of workers while our labor is a thing that creates billions of dollars in profit. North Carolina has the lowest rates of union membership in the country. We learned that union rights are actually tied to the legacy of slavery. Racism is used as a tool to divide workers and pass anti-union laws that are still in place today. And these policies have a real impact on our lives. So why am I so focused on unions here in the South? Because poverty and racism are systemic problems that, are, that need systemic solutions. We are that solution. My name is Saru Jayaraman. I've been fighting to raise wages and working conditions in the restaurant and service sector for the last 20 years. These are the poorest workers in America suffering for the subminimum wage of $2.13 an hour. And that is why I am joining with the Poor People's Campaign National Call for Moral Revival. Today, 70% of tipped workers are women, disproportionately women of color and single moms struggling to survive on two and three dollar wages in 43 states with the highest levels of economic insecurity and sexual harassment of any industry. That was prior to the pandemic. With the pandemic, 10 million of these workers have lost their jobs and 60% are reporting that they cannot access unemployment insurance because that sub minimum wage plus tips is too low to meet minimum straight state thresholds to qualify for benefits. They are being penalized for being too poor. My name is Tripti Patel and I'm a bartender in downtown DC. In Washington DC, the sub minimum wage is $4.45 an hour. I have to rely on tips to make up the base minimum wage in the District of Columbia, which is $14 an hour. No one should have to live tip to mouth. We could end this type of injustice if we had something called one fair wage. When you have one fair wage, you allow the people to end economic anxiety. They don't have to live in economic roulette and they have the ability to save and weather the storms that is the crisis of COVID-19. I invite all of you to fight for one fair wage. We demand a national living wage. We demand that everyone have a living wage, no matter the state where you live. Guarantee income, full employment, the right for workers to farm union, and equal pay for equal work. And that is why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign. That is why we are organizing to change the narrative and we won't be silent anymore. And now I'm gonna to go to Polly, who's a certified nursing assistant. Thank you for this platform. We are not protective. And these patients are coughing and there's all type of symptoms. As I speak to you right now, I'm busy smuggling, smuggling PPE to my co-workers. This is mass murder. And we become the sacrificial lamb. I'm sure, have y'all seen on the news what's happening in the meatpacking industry? You know, they were forcing people to go to work. How inhumane and how violent is that? This Sioux Falls, South Dakota pork processing plant linked to nearly 900 cases, more than half of the state's nearly 1,700 cases. Here in Alabama, the people who are dying the most from this coronavirus are black, but I'm sure the vast majority of those that are dying are poor. 
You'll forgive me if my jaw's on the ground. U.S. weekly jobless claims 6.6 million versus 3.1 million expected. 6.6 million. We are we are clearly in a major recession with major impacts on working men and women in this country. In Kansas is where I'm at. Um, a lot of people have lost their jobs, and our jobs are connected to our healthcare. Um, it's also exposed what we already knew is that some lives are deemed more important than other lives. Some lives are just disposable. So uh, I think that I uh, continue to stay connected to the Poor People's Campaign because it's a matter of life and death. Those who are rich and greedy don't want to talk about who's living in poverty, but that's because they don't want us to identify with each other. Thousands of flight attendants at regional airlines earn the equivalent of less than $15 an hour. We're aviation's first responders, but like so many essential workers, many flight attendants live at or below the poverty line. And we're not getting any pandemic pay either. We're working to keep essential travel moving, and the federal government has refused to issue guidelines for safety on planes as well, putting flight attendants and passengers alike in unnecessary danger. I'd like to introduce you to Katura Johnson, one of our union members, who will offer her firsthand experience. My name is Katura Johnson, and I am a regional flight attendant. Many people don't know that regional flight attendants are paid 45% less than major mainline flight attendants who do the same job. Although we are aviators first responders and one job should be enough, we are frequently forced to find additional jobs to pay our bills and make ends meet. That's why we are joining the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival to demand fair treatment for all workers. Did you know that 98% of hospitality workers have been laid off because of COVID-19? My name is Nia Winston and I'm the General Vice President of the Union Unite Here, which represents workers in hospitality and service industry where nearly a quarter of Black Americans work. Right now, the unemployment rate for Black people in the U.S. is almost twice as high as for white people. Less than 50% of Black adults now have a job. Black workers need a union because otherwise, we're the last to be hired but the first to be fired. I believe that building my union is a racial justice project. All black people, all working people do better when we are in unions. There's a system of interlocking injustices of economic inequalities, of racism that runs so deep in America. COVID-19 has deepened these injustices, but it also heightens the world awareness now more than ever. Just being aware, it is not enough. Just saying you want to do something is simply not enough. It requires a collective effort to actually create a change. Now I'd like to introduce a Unite Here member, Dwayne Thwaites, who works in concessions at Marlins Ballpark in Miami to tell us his story of how Unite Here is fighting back in Florida. Dwayne? So here in Florida, there's been about 2.1 million people who've applied for unemployment. And currently, less than 50% has received it. In part, this is unacceptable. It's not something that we as citizens should accept from our local government. We did two caravans and contested this, demanding that the governor do an executive order that requires the state to actually pay out the unemployment as fast as possible. It's over eight weeks for some people. Some people, it's close to the 10 and 11 weeks. I've had to wait over eight weeks to receive an unemployment check and go almost six to seven weeks before even getting a response from the unemployment office. They're not answering the phones, the lines is crowded, the system is crashing, it was bad. Something needed to be done. And the governor and, and the representatives from the state are just sitting, sitting there doing nothing while we the people are suffering. I'm George Gresham, president of 1199 SEIU, representing 450,000 healthcare workers. Did you know that 70% of the nursing homes fall below the recommended standard of care of four hours per resident per day? It's difficult to give the quality care that residents deserve at such low staffing levels. When COVID-19 hit and families were unable to visit their relatives, 
Nurse and home workers became the family for the residents. Here is Reva McKenney, 1199, to tell her story. My name is Reva McKenney, and I'm a CNA at the Greenhouse Nursing Home in Baltimore, Maryland. I've seen a lot over the past 20 years, but COVID-19 presented long-term workers with challenges we were never prepared for. Too many long-term care workers were left unprotected when the federal government basically dropped the ball. We were left without proper PPE equipment or supplies. A lot of us brought our own masks and ponchos. This is not acceptable for people who are responsible for the care of our elderly and most vulnerable. If we had been given the same access to PPE as our sisters and brothers in the hospitals, I know that our nursing homes would not have been so badly affected. It is very stressful to take care of my patients and my own family. I was desperately afraid of bringing the virus home to them and did everything I could not to. But for many of our patients, nursing home workers are their families. We were literally some residents only communication to the outside world. We cannot let this happen again. We must make sure all workers are protected. Our residents should never fear their own safety because our government is not protecting healthcare workers. It is wonderful to be called a hero, but it's more important to have what we need to care for ourselves and our patients. Did you know that Dr. King's last fight for racial and economic justice was arm in arm with AFSME? In 1968, as he was planning the original Poor People's Campaign, he came to Memphis to express solidarity with AFSME sanitation workers, 1,300 African-American men who had gone on strike to demand dignity and respect. The slogan was proud, simple, and defiant. I am a man. To this day, and everything AFSME members do to serve and strengthen our communities, especially amid this devastating pandemic, we are inspired by Dr. King's courage and sacrifice and his commitment to eradicating poverty for people of all races. Now I want you to meet John Henry, one of AFSME's everyday heroes who works as a disease intervention specialist for the city of Columbus, Ohio. Thank you, President Saunders. In my role as a public health professional, Every day, I see huge disparities in access to quality health care. I see it in my regular job where I help high-risk populations access medicine that can prevent HIV infection. And I've seen it during the last few months of the coronavirus pandemic when I've been reassigned to work as a contact tracer. COVID-19 has presented health and financial challenges for families across the country. It's disheartening while at the same time, I see hope um, that we could change these things, that we could reinvest in public health, that we could give it the funding and prioritize it in the way that it should be. We need to do more to break down the barriers of trust and fill in the gaps of funding that would level the playing field, giving us a fair healthcare system that serves everyone. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother. And it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on. I tell you, it's gone on. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother. And it's gone on. And we won't be silent anymore. Oh, somebody.
America, the prophets of our time are speaking. We need nothing short of a revolution of values, radical revolution of values to change this nation, to address the interlocking evils and injustices of our time. Systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war-based economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. That is why this morning we launched the Poor People's Moral Justice Jubilee Policy Platform as an update to our moral agenda and moral budget. We need your help in getting this platform to our elected officials. So we are asking you to go to june2020.org or text moral to 90975 and make sure we get this urgent policy platform to our elected officials. Please help us today. This is not a time to tinker around the edges with small reforms. We need bold demands and a complete restructuring of society to address these interlocking injustices. Go now to june2020.org or text now moral to 90975 to send these demands now to Congress. You know, I'm from Louisiana, it's my home state, and those numbers are absolutely staggering. And when I saw this beginning to happen, this narrative about how we were just gonna go ahead and reopen the country, there was a clear racial tinge to it. Um, there was this sense that as uh, news outlets like yours have begun to cover these racial disparities, that conservative politicians around the country made a, a big shift in the way that they were talking about this and said, oh, okay, well, we can reopen the country. And underneath that, underlying that is this idea that that these lives don't have value. So when I use the term necropolitics, that is a political theory term. It was coined by a man named Ashilin Mbembe, uh, and it really refers to the politics of death, how governments, how state power entities use policy to determine whose lives are worth protecting, whose lives are valuable, and whose lives are expendable. And I know that we don't typically like to think about our government as acting in that kind of way, but we are really facing a pandemic in which we have lost almost 65,000 people in a matter of, a, of eight weeks or so. So we are absolutely at this point talking about the politics of death, and we need the kind of terminology that helps us to think about how is the gov government determining how it's enacting policy. Yeah, I mean, and you know, Seth, when you when you think about it, right, you go all the way back, right? You know, the life of an enslaved person was only as valuable as how many they could reproduce of more people who were thought to be owned by the person that called themselves the owner, right? You go all the way through the history of American work, you know, the immigrant workers in the 1920s and in the Gilded Age, it's not like people thought their lives had any value other than how many times they could crank the wheel. And, you know, the idea of giving them a day off or not giving them an eight-hour day, people had to literally strike and they have violent strikes, you know, to try to get that, the violence against them. So the idea about American work, the people at the lowest end of the work pool, has always been a sense of, do you value this human or are they just a means to an end? And it feels like we're back there again. I almost feel like we're sort of reliving the Calvin Coolidge era. Your thoughts, Seth? Uh, I think that's precisely right. I think it's a continuation of a long history in the United States of devaluing working people, particularly brown and black working people. Um, this order that President Trump put in place under the Defense Production Act that essentially forces the African American and Latino workers, overwhelmingly also some white workers, back into chicken and pork and beef production plants so that they can be responsible for getting the food supply back in shape. Those are some of the most dangerous dangerous workplaces in our country. And so what we're seeing is an exposure of the inequalities that have existed in our society for a very long time. And if 
we can start with the health inequalities. There is an unequal distribution based on race of health care and health insurance in our country. This administration, in a crisis, easily could have responded to that with extending health insurance, reopening the Obamacare uh, exchanges, making health insurance more widely available, picking up the call to pay for all COVID treatments for any worker, particularly a frontline worker who's exposed. None of those things have been done. So you can't say that you care about workers if everything you do, every policy, taking OSHA off the beat, not giving PPE, not providing health insurance, results in those workers having a much increased likelihood of death. The United States spends more for health care than any other advanced nation in the world, and yet 87 million people here have inadequate or no health insurance. Did you know that 72 million people cannot afford their medical bills and had to take out loans or suffered other financial hardships simply because they got sick? The prescription drug industry is the most profitable industry in the United States. They shouldn't be making even more profits off of the COVID pandemic. And now let's hear the stories from the people who are actually on the front lines of this crisis. I'm Natalia Fajardo, and four weeks ago, I was okay. Like, I'm young, have no kids, and I'm healthy. So is my partner, Gabriel. We don't have a lot, but we have enough, or so we thought. Until this pandemic hit, all of a sudden, the chocolate factory I work for closed, so I'm out of work. Now more than ever, I feel the fragility of just being okay. My partner and I are part of the millions that are just one emergency away from losing it all. Meanwhile, our government uses this crisis to fatten the pockets of those who can't fit any more bills in their already overstuffed pockets. I'm a volunteer organizer with the Poor People's Campaign in Wisconsin because I know there is enough, enough food, enough clean and safe water, and definitely enough money for every human being, not just in this country, but in our planet, to live with dignity. So join me in fighting to create the society we all deserve to live in. I am Danita Jones from Dallas, Texas. I reside in Dallas County. I continually wear a mask to this day. And it's just frightening that we have 236 more cases in Dallas County. 236 more since last night. And I have to report to work. And then once I report to work, I have to return home to my family. I have to return home. And when I do return home, I call to let my daughter know that I'm here, I'm outside, so that everyone else can go into their room and I can go into the kitchen and wash my hands and my face and take my clothes straight to the laundry room. This is what my life has been like since returning to work. And this is not fair to them, nor is it fair to me or any essential employee or any employees. Mother's Day was this past weekend. And my daughter, in a loving letter to me, wrote, I'm so afraid to leave for work, especially when was gone. It breaks my heart because I don't know what's going to happen when you come back. Hi, my name is Nikita Wakes. I live in Flint, Michigan. I am age 44 with two children. My life before the COVID-19 has been very stressful. It has been over six years, and we are still fighting for clean water here in Flint, Michigan. The lead exposure impacted my family tremendously. I lost two sets of twins due to drinking the contaminated water, and my daughter also miscarried. Not only am I fighting for clean water, but I'm also fighting for my son's education. My son is struggling in school. Um, the lead exposure, due to the lead exposure, he's had a lot of problems in school. He's a special education student, and these schools are getting the special education money, but not providing the special education care these children need. Due to the COVID-19, um, there has been a lot of deaths that I know of, people that I know that have died from the virus. And all I can do is pray and keep moving on for my family. 
Um, I have no personal transportation, so I rely on friends to take me to the stores for grocery and for massive amount of bottled water that are needed for me. Because here in Flint, we need to use bottled water for everything, washing off our vegetables, everything. We cannot drink our tap water. But now that I'm going out to the stores, the shelves are often empty of the supplies that we desperately need here in Flint. This is why we demand full Medicaid expansion, Medicare protection, and universal health care for all. We demand free treatment for COVID-19. Throughout this pandemic, the healthcare industry is expected to make huge profits. That march for profit, that drive for profit, isn't, is not going to change unless we actually demand that change collectively and together, because we're all gonna need this care. And I think that's the thing that unites us. It's been hurtful uh, to know that when I go to the doctors and I'm not uh, sure if I'm gonna get the proper service, they do treat me different if they know that my insurance isn't as high quality as others. This is why we are organizing to change the narrative. We won't be silent anymore. Hi, I'm Al Gore, chairman of the Climate Reality Project, and I'm proud to be part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Because right now, this call for a revival could not be more timely or more important. We are way overdue in America for a solid reckoning that brings everyone closer to understanding the intersection of the critical issues we're facing in our time. So I'm very proud to be working alongside Reverend William Barber II, Reverend Liz Theo Harris, and the Poor People's Campaign. And alongside all those who are fighting to expose and address these evils and intolerable injustices. We already know that poverty and systemic racism are completely and tightly linked with the climate crisis. And the climate crisis is already causing massive human suffering around the world and in our country and will cause even more impacts unless we act with urgency. When our planet heats up, it disproportionately affects the most vulnerable, and that's particularly true for low-income families, communities of color, the elderly, infants and children, also the mentally ill and the homeless and those with pre-existing conditions. The climate crisis, if it's not addressed, threatens to push another 100 million people worldwide into poverty by 2030. And that's on top of the present poverty crisis in this country, where today nearly 140 million Americans are poor or low income. These impacts have been brought into much clearer focus recently, as evidence shows that exposure to more air pollution significantly increases the infection rates and mortality rates from COVID-19. For these reasons and so many more, this moral call is so critical to raise national attention and focus it on those affected by ecological devastation, to lift up their voices, and to enable leaders from those communities to lead the way toward real solutions. At this critical moment in our country's history, we can and we must move forward together and we're not moving one step back. Hi, I'm Jane Fonda. Climate crises cause massive human suffering. That's why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Did you know that a third of the people in this country cannot afford water? The accidents and the toxins from the fossil fuel industry particularly harm communities of color. Investments in clean water and energy could create jobs and save trillions of dollars from ecological devastation. And really strengthen and protect the health of all the people. It's time to hear from the front line of this crisis. My name is Sarah Ann Young Bear Brown. My Meskwaki name is Tika Mikiha, which means woman standing on the edge of a river, the fish clan. 
Today, the Meskwaki people are the only remaining tribe living in Iowa State. This land is beautiful, and the land holds the spirits and memories of our peoples, our villages, ceremonies, and prayers. Our people were caretakers and believed that this land would take care of us, and in our turn, we would take care of the land. With that thought, let's come together and help each other. My name is Olinka Green, and I'm here today to talk about environmental racism. I live in a place called Dallas, Texas. And in Dallas, Texas, we have three Superfund sites. A Superfund site means when an area has been declared by the United States government as toxic. We are being, we are being killed by air, because with the concrete batch plants. We are being killed by the water with a place called Lane Plating where a company has been there for 90 years. And in the 90 years that they have been there, they have put cyanide, mercury, lead, hexavalium chromate, sulfur in our water and in our ground. Our children are dying. Our children are developing skin cancer. Our women are developing breast cancer. We are being attacked by the corporate Ku Klux Klan. White supremacy used to be in a sheet. Now it is wrapped up in a corporate business suit. My name is Nick Smith. I'm from southwestern Virginia in the coal fields of central Appalachia. I'm the son of a coal miner's daughter. <laughs> so that's two generations of not having access to the good union jobs, I guess is the way to put it. And as the coal jobs have disappeared, nothing's really come in its place, and it's created chronic poverty. Poverty is a generational thing. You know, you're, if you grow up poor, your upward mobility to become not poor is stunted. I grew up around mountaintop removal sites, natural gas, hydraulic fracturing, the uh, water that ran into our house that we bathed in, we couldn't drink. We couldn't drink the water we bathed in. It seems like every year or so, a relative of mine is dying from cancer because of this ecological devastation and you know I can't get off work to go uh, to go to the funerals if we want to get out of poverty is either go into debt go in the military which many people are not fit to do and when we try to fight our abilities taken from us because of anti-union legislation such as right to work I'm here because my papa he was a union coal miner he was there at the Pittston coal strike in 1989 when the company decided to cut the health care benefits for retired miners. Fighting these poverty issues, many of the poor people are divided uh, by race, were intentionally segregated even, and it hurts poor whites as well as poor black and brown folks. It's an across-the-board thing. As long as we're divided, they can conquer. Everybody is aware that that school where her grandchild is going to is being poisoned at rates seven, 100 times, 400 to 700 times, what EPA has determined is a safe level of that poison that's being emitted throughout the parish. If they close that school in an emergency plan to protect the children, that school sits right smack dab in the middle of a black community, a 100%. Not only is that school being exposed at, at that egregious level, that entire community, one of which I live in, which my children were raised in, my wife and daughter and my immediate family are suffering right now. My youngest daughter have some horrible kind of disease we'd never heard of. The doctor said the chances of her getting that was one in five million. And there are three other young ladies in the same community with the same disease. This is why we demand 100% clean energy and a transition to a green economy. Fully funded water and sanitation infrastructure. A ban on mining, drilling, and burning dirty energy. We demand the protection of native lands from polluting. We are coming together to change the narrative. Somebody's hurting our brothers and sisters and we won't be silent anymore. My name is Reverend Mark Thompson 
going to spend just a few brief moments here with a renowned economist, since we're talking about poverty, with a renowned economist, Dr. Julianne Malvo. Dr. Julianne Malvo, welcome to you. And Dr. Barber has a couple of questions he wants me to ask you. Before COVID-19 hit, Donald Trump saying his economy was great, great, great economy. <laughs> uh, what's what's your analysis? What is is it is it great? What's the state of the economy? Can it recover? Well, first of all, great for who? You know, you you got these MAGA hats running around talking about make America great again. Well, who? The fact is that, and I, I've seen these um, media things talk about American crisis win. Black America has always been in crisis in connection to this pandemic. Poor America, not just Black America, poor America has always been in crisis. The way that capitalism works is that you have to exploit somebody so somebody else can make money. And so when we look at it, it's Black folks at the bottom, but there are other people who are being exploited. Poor white people, Appalachian people, Latino people, people who work in the buildings when the buildings are closed, who are doing the, um, you know, doing the maintenance work. This is a function of a predatory capitalist society that says, I will take from you. So the question is, what, what do we do about this? And the answer is the 140 million people who are being exploited need to rise up. Yeah. Plain and simple. The folks need to rise up. And when we look at the series of questions that we're raising, we're raising questions about um, the way our economy works. Dr. King once said, there are 40 million poor people in our society. And you have to ask what kind of society creates 40 million poor people. Then he said, so then you have to ask who owns oil, who owns the iron ore? If the world is two thirds water, why do we pay water bills? Um, and I do say, don't, don't send that to your water company because they ain't gonna turn out right. But the bottom line on that is, what Dr. King was raising questions of the economic structure, a predatory capitalist structure that exploited people. Yeah. And we have accepted that and we cannot. Dr. Julianne Malvo, ladies and gentlemen, Forward together, not one step back. Yat e She'e Daryl Marks. Indigenous people have experienced generations of violence from the first chapter of this nation's history. That's why I'm a part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Did you know U.S. history begins with the genocide of Native American people? That 60% of Native American communities are considered poor? that our native health institutions have gone unsupported for decades, alongside failing schools, poverty, and police brutality. Sacred lands are being destroyed by extraction. It's time to hear from these communities. But the indigenous people in the surrounding communities that are being affected, we talk about health care. We talk about worrying about the environment, but yet when they're allowing open pit mines and um, letting it leak into the land, into the water, the high rate of cancer and the high bills of health is going to continue to raise because of corporations and greeds and politicians that don't want to listen. My name is Lois Wimmer. I am a Lakota native born woman raised on the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe Reservation in South Dakota. I am a mother and a grandmother. I have experienced the profound ways that poverty has affected all people in this community and in this country. And I have experienced how systemic racism often makes these struggles worse for people of color and native people like me. Growing up, my family, the poorest in this wealthy country, the poverty and low income rate among Native American people is very likely higher than 65%. Me and my family are part of it. I left the reservation as a teenager, but I see how generation poverty and systemic racism affects people in Kansas City too. Currently, my income is only 470 a month. My partner works for the same property management company as me and has had for 15 years. 
He makes $10.50 an hour. Our rent is $600 each month, all utilities paid. That means close to 50% of our income goes to housing. The majority of my neighbors in Kansas City's Northeast neighborhood are poor immigrants, people of color, and poor whites. Almost 60% of us are tenants, and we struggle to pay our rent as it is. In many ways, the struggle of Native people is mirrored in the struggle of all oppressed people against the continuing injustices of inequality, systemic racism, and poverty. I am honored to be a part of the Poor People's Campaign. This country was birthed by the attempt of genocide against us, and it didn't work. And we are at a point in this country where this reckoning over the racist birth of this place must happen. Our fate and our destiny is intertwined with our black relatives, our other people of color, our LGBTQIA2A plus, people who are newly arrived to this country. Our future will be something we create together. We demand that our rights as indigenous people be protected and respected, including our lands and resources, and the freedom to exercise our culture and religion. We demand sovereignty for all First Nations, constitutional guarantees, human rights, and treaty protections. The first chapter of this country must be told so that we can build a true foundation that will support us all. This is why we are changing the narrative. We won't be silent anymore. Did you know that there are 45 million immigrants in the United States? 11 million of them are undocumented. Did you know that undocumented immigrants pay more in taxes than the wealthiest 1%, but they are blocked from public services? Did you know that many immigrants are considered essential workers, but yet they've been harassed and separated from their families? It is time to hear from them, their voices, their pain, their hopes. Ingresé a este país ilegalmente poder darles un mejor futuro a mis hijos. Uno de ellos fue el no portar un documento para poder trabajar legalmente en este país. El segundo de ellos fue no poder tener derecho a la salud. Y el tercero fue la discriminación. Since the DREAM Act was not passed, temporary protective status, known as TPS, was rescinded. Ever since the president initiated the zero tolerance policy, in order to separate children from their parents at the border, life has continued to only become more difficult for immigrant families. Separation of families doesn't just occur at the border, it occurs here in our own state. Our immigrant families continue to bring us horrific cases of discrimination, racial profiling, and abuse by ICE, and being dehumanized. No somos delincuentes. We are not criminals. No somos uh, animales, como nos dicen. We are not animals, as they are somos calling us. Somos personas que venimos a trabajar. We are human beings that come to work. Queremos salir adelante. We need to progress. Queremos estudiar. We, we need to study. Y queremos que nuestros hijos sean gente de provecho. And we want our kids to grow up in a society, in a good society. Todos somos seres humanos. We are all human beings. Y necesitamos derechos. And we need rights. Respeto. Respect. Y que nuestra dignidad no se nos quite. And that they should never take away our dignity. This is why we demand an immigration system that protects immigrants' rights to build communities and strengthen democracy. An end to detention, deportation, and a stop to building a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. I have lived in the U.S. for most of my life as an undocumented immigrant. 
I have seen countless immigrant communities forced to live in poverty because the immigration system is working as intended to create fear and control over our people. Immigrants and all working class people must unite to create a system that values humanity over profits. This is the reason why we are joining the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, to ensure that our communities can thrive, grow, and have the future that every single person in this country deserves. And in communities all across this country, the Poor People's Campaign is mobilizing, organizing, registering, and educating people for a movement that votes. And there have been so many people who have died and who have given their lives and paid for the right to vote. And so today we are standing strong against the extreme forces of racist voter suppression that keeps us from the polls. The Poor People's Campaign is strictly nonpartisan, but we are deeply political. This is not about left versus right. This is about right versus wrong. This means that we do not endorse candidates and we will never bite our tongue if an elected official or any political party runs from the issues of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism or militarism and the war economy. And we need to vote this year, like our lives depend on it, because they do. And I can hear Queen Mother Fannie Lou Hamer saying, because we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, we must be at the polls. We must show up. And so we're asking you right now to go to June2020.org to make sure you are registered to vote and to make sure your status is up to date. And so we must stand, we must vote, and we must make our voices heard at the polls. And so coming up next, you will hear voices from activists and artists who are standing with us, such as Erica Alexander and David Olowu, and they will be standing side homeless organizers and folks fighting for housing rights across the country. And I cannot forget my brothers and sisters with the Divine Nine. They will be standing with us today. So stay tuned. Alexander, and I'm very happy to be in support of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Many of you know me from the roles I've played, but I was born in the mountains of Arizona. Both of my parents were orphans. My father was an itinerant preacher, and my mother was a teacher. We lived the first 10 years of my life in a hotel called Starlight off of Route 66. I'm here to tell you right now that voter suppression and racial injustice destroys the dreams of ordinary Americans who are extraordinary in their possibilities. Did you know there are 52 million low-income and poor voters in this country? And over the past decade, we've seen 27 states pass voter suppression measures. These voter suppression laws target black, brown, and native communities. But the laws that are passed when people are brought into office through voter suppression affect people of all races. They wouldn't be fighting us this hard if they didn't know the power of our vote. And in this pandemic, we are witnessing an even greater attack on our democracy. And let's now hear from the people on the front lines of this crisis. My name is Braxton Brewington, and I am a senior at North Carolina a t State University. I don't see a difference between gerrymandering and the three-fifths compromise. Mm. I don't see the difference between racist photo ID laws and a poll tax. <laughs> Ever since black people and women have earned the right to vote in this country, we've seen the suppression of democracy sweep across this nation and unfortunately penetrate the state of North Carolina. In fact, voter registration here in the United States 
originated as a method of disenfranchisement, as a way to subjugate poor people and immigrants and young people and people of color and women. Fast forward to 2018 where North Carolina serves unfortunately as the national poster child for racial and partisan gerrymandering. My own campus, North Carolina A&T, has become a prominent victim of voter disenfranchisement. The largest public HBCU in the nation, now enrolling over 12,000 students, was divided into two different congressional districts right here in Greensboro. And they did this to us intentionally because they know the power of our vote. I'm from Dodge City, Kansas, known in history as a cowboy capital, as well as the wickedest little city in the West. And the latter still holds true today. It's a Latino majority community run by a group of people as diverse as a 1950s TV ad, which is to say, not at all. Access to the polls should not be one of those issues that has become partisan, but unfortunately, unfortunately in Dodge City and across the country, it has. It's a city with nearly 30,000 people and 14,000 registered voters. Those voters have one polling place located in one of the few affluent and white areas of town. It's the most burdened polling location in Kansas. This is what happens when democracy is not valued and left to those who simply don't care if it doesn't affect them. My name is Maria Colville, a native of Trinidad and Tobago, who have been living in Massachusetts, living and working in Massachusetts for over 30 years in the medical field as a CNA, a PCA, a companion. There are systems in place to ensure that I don't succeed. You can't achieve your goals or dreams when you are working for a wage that does not even allow you to meet your basic needs. I thought my issues was just that, mine. I found out I was not alone. Millions of people have the same problems that I was experiencing. We are all hostages of poverty, primarily because we lack the knowledge of truth. We are the solution to every problem that we face. In, our, in your brokenness, to unify, mobilize, come together, because then we are stronger than the forces against us. Broken, busted, and disgusted in one voice. <laughs> Speaking truth to power. I found my voice when I joined a cause bigger than myself. That causes you. This is why we demand a restoration and expansion of the Voting Rights Act. An end to racist gerrymandering, same day registration, early voting, and an election day holiday. We also demand that people who are formerly incarcerated have the right to vote. They have paid their debt to society and they are human beings. We demand that they have the right to vote. It is time for us to come together and build a movement to assure that democracy will survive. And that's why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Hi everyone, I'm David. To vote is to be heard. To be heard is to bring about change. So in this moment, use your power, use your vote, bring about that change. That's why I'm part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. The National Panhellenic Council, representing nine African-American Greek letter fraternities and sororities, are officially referred to as the Divine Nine. They are proud today to be a part of this digital justice gathering, the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington. We raise our letters high as we join with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival to build a movement to force this nation to address the interlocking crises of systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the war-based economy and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. I, a life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, 
join these great leaders of the National Panhellenic Council in the class. Hello. Hello. My name is Vanetta Cheeks Reader. I'm the 34th National President of the National Panhellenic Council Incorporated. I am also a proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated and together we rise. I am Casey A. Coleman, International Second Vice President of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and Chairman of the National Panhellenic Council Incorporated National Undergraduate Leadership Council. Together we rise. I am Everett Ward, General President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and Chair of the Council of Presidents of the National Panhellenic Council. Together we rise. I am Glenda Glover, International President of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Together we rise. My name is Reuben Shelton. I'm the Grand Pole Mark of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated and together we rise. I am Dr. David Marion, the Grand Basilis of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity. Together, we rise. I am Beverly Evan Smith, National President and CEO of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Together, we rise. Greetings. I am Valerie Hollingsworth Baker, and I am the International Centennial President of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. And together, we rise. I am Deborah Ketching Smith, 24th International Grand Basilisk of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Together we rise. Hello, this is Andre Manson, 22nd International Grand Polaris of Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. And together we rise. Hi, Michael Crystal, International President, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. And we're proud to support the Poor People's Campaign Virtual March on June 20th, because together we rise. Did you know that eight to 11 million people are homeless and on the streets right now? 1.5 million of them are school-aged children. But in this country, we have more housing units than people who need them. We throw away more food than our families can possibly eat. And we have the best healthcare technology in the world, but the worst provision. This is a system that must change. It's now time to hear from the front lines of this crisis. My name is Anu Yadav. I'm an artist, I'm a playwright, and an actress and an educator. I started out doing this work, doing housing organizing as an ally, or so I thought, to public housing residents who were protesting the demolition and forced relocation of their homes. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked, and I went to the people that I thought I was an ally to because they were guiding me. I am the daughter of Indian Hindu immigrants to this country, and this movement is for my father, who struggled with steady work, who blamed himself for not having enough for his family who was in and out of the psychiatric ward of a hospital and who killed himself when I was 10. This movement is for my mother, who raised me and my brother without anybody around, without anybody. And this movement is for me, and this movement is for you, each of us, all of our family members, because no one gets left behind. I myself am a worker for IHSS, I'm a care provider, I'm a single mom, I just barely got into low-income housing and fireball, and I have been homeless, not necessarily sleeping on the streets, but with my child, have had to live with somebody because I could not afford to rent in my own apartment. But thanks to low-income housing, I do now, and, and my life's getting a lot better. And my mom had died out there, and it's not something I wanted to have to deal with, but I... I do, and I'm here because I don't want her to have died in vain. I had to go down there to G Street and look for her when I wanted her to be grandma to my kids. And those places are scary sometimes because they're hiding in the dark because they're not allowed to be there. And they're gonna get in trouble if they, 
they're hiding from the police and they're hiding from being harassed. Give them a place where they can go. If they can't be anywhere else, give them somewhere. My name is India and I'm a 38 year old mother of five. Arkansas is the only state in the U.S. where landlords are not required to make home repairs. So they often refuse. I've woken up in the morning to use the restroom. And when I flushed the toilet, feces came out of the faucet, straight into the tub. When this happened, I had to hurry up and clean it because this is the same tub that my children need to get ready for school in every morning. You think that this could only happen once, but this was my experience in not one, not two, but three different homes I rented that were owned by three different landlords. These dangerous, unempathetic practices are part of a system that has been set up by the privileged and wealthy against and to the detriment of me and all of the working class poor people. But what they did not count on was us us galvanizing our collectives, us drawing strength from those who came before us, us unifying, standing shoulder to shoulder, empowering each other, us loving to get in good trouble, and us being that new and unsettling force who will not stop until we have safe housing for all people and for future, future generations to come. My name is Zolanda Woods, and I'm a member of the Homeless Union. We believe that when poor people name their own priorities because they know their own needs and know what needs to happen, that real change will be produced. If poor people are not allowed to speak these priorities for themselves, no one else will. I understand some things about poverty because I am a poor person, having four children living off of disability due to chronic medical conditions. I have been forced out after speaking out about substandard living conditions in Greensboro and homeless after aging out of foster care. But this is not just about my story. This is about how there's too many people in situations like mine. And when there's this many people getting evicted and separated from their families and getting criminalized and becoming homeless, then we know it's not just about one of us. 23 families face eviction every day in Greensboro. And more than half of these people wind up homeless because of it. And the vast majority of these folks are people who have already been beaten up by the system. Black folks, brown folks, disabled folks, elderly folks, and children. But the people who maintain this system don't wanna talk about it. They want to blame us and blame this mess on us like it's our individual choices that got us into this. We have to correct that. We have to remind people that mass homelessness is not an individual moral issue. Mass homelessness is a society's collective moral failure. This is why we demand housing for all. We demand an expansion of public and affordable housing. We demand relief from, from household and mortgage debt and rent payments during this crisis. We demand expanding SNAP and other programs to meet traditional needs. This is why we're changing the narrative. We won't be silent anymore. Public education is under attack. Did you know that half of kindergarten through 12th grade students are in segregated schools? Did you know that one and a half million students were homeless in 2018? Were you aware that student debt is now over $1.5 trillion, affecting 44 million households? Now you will hear from people who have been impacted by this crisis. Hi, I'm Randy Weingarten, President of the American Federation of Teachers. On behalf of our 1.7 million members, we are so blessed to be here partnering with the Poor People's Campaign Mass Assembly and all of you as we raise our voices and take action together for a better future. Meanwhile, black and brown students whose schools were denied 
almost a half a trillion dollars, yes, I said half a trillion, in the last several decades, are now being told by Republicans in the U.S. Senate they should return to schools with even less funding. This immoral attack on our nation's children and the undermining of public education and public higher education must end. Let me introduce myself. My name is Carla Mendez Guerrero. I am deaf. I myself am the first in my family to go to college. And I do admit I have struggled, I've been struggling financially. My father's income increased recently, but then that resulted in them cutting my financial aid. So his increase in income isn't enough to support my schooling. College is so expensive, I'm overwhelmed. There are actually 120 students at Gallaudet that have had to leave due school due to financial issues. They can't afford food, their dorm, their transportation. That's actually 10% of our student undergrad student body at Gallaudet. We're trying to follow our dreams, but it, they seem impossible without support. As a young person living in Harlan County, um, I think a lot of times our voices are put down. A lot of people around here um, don't really realize the issues that are going on. And um, I think that it's time that we, as a people, educate the people that don't know what's going on, what's going on in their communities. It's time that we show our elected officials, our state legislators, what's going on and that us young people know what they're doing, that us young people and us as the people are going to rise above and that we will not lay silent no more. I bring you greetings as a native here in Chula, Mississippi, but also an educator here in Holmes County Consolidated School District. Um, there are very limited resources here in Chula as, as I grew up. There are very limited jobs, there are very limited resources such as mental health facilities, recreation centers, and even sometimes there are very limited resources when it came to schools. Notice when, when the state get ready to cut budgets and cuts funds, the first budget they go to is the education budget because a lot of their children are not in the schools that we're teaching them. A lot of children, a lot of their children are in the schools that our kids go to school and most of them are in those private schools and we must know uh, we see a lot of charter schools that are opening up here in the state of Mississippi and we also need to know that a lot of our state funds is coming from the government and stuff that's coming from the education budget is going over into those charter schools. This is why we demand equity in education. An end to the resegregation of schools. Relief from crushing student debt free tuition at public institutions, and equitable funding for HBCUs and Native institutions. This is why we are changing the narrative. We, we won't, won't be, be silent, silent anymore. anymore. Last year, I received a call from Dr. Barber to come and join this movement. And the year before he was gunned down on a Memphis balcony, I met Dr. King and Fannie Lou Hamer marching on the streets of Indianola, Mississippi. We are living in similar times when a new movement is being birthed and born. But we need you to help us grow and build that movement. And so I invite you now to join us at June2020.org or text MORAL to 90975, june2020.org, or text MORAL to 90975. We know that when movements start to push this nation forward, that there is always a backlash from those who don't want to see everybody enjoying the lot rights and liberties promised to us by our Constitution and our holiest of scriptures. But if we mobilize, organize, register, and educate like never before, we will be there to meet the backlash with a movement that's too strong and too broad to be broken. 
The Poor People's Campaign needs your support. We need you to show up with your bodies and your voice. We need you to get the Poor People's Moral Justice Jubilee Policy Platform into the hands of Congress. We need you to vote, and we need your financial support. To donate, we are asking you to please text MORAL to 90975 or go to june2020.org. We need your support in all of these ways, and we need you to donate. Hi, I'm Dante Sharp. I was wrongfully convicted of murder in 1994. Uh, I did 25, almost 26 years. I see, I noticed a lot of things. I noticed a mass incarceration and the people that, that uh, make up the mass incarceration are poor people. You know, if you're poor, you're going to jail. That's just idea. If you have no money, you're going to jail. You know, you don't have, you don't have the funds to hire lawyers and the system is set up really to oppress the poor, keep them down, you know, encourage people to get out and vote, encourage the kids, the young kids to get off the streets. Just do what you, your part, what you can do, what's, what's available to you right, right in front of you. Hi, my name is Caitlin Swain. Poor communities are being locked up and locked out. Did you know we spend $179 billion annually on incarceration. Did you know that the United States has 4% of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated population? We have to fight for power over the corporations that hurt us, power over the justice system that exploits us, and power over so many of the systems that put us in harm's way. Hello, my name is Connie Swain. My son is Anthony Swain, and my husband here is Anthony Swain Sr. We have been on a complete roller coaster ever since Anthony has been incarcerated, which started actually in February of 2016. Anthony is a paraplegic 40-year-old Black man who was shot in the back at age 20. He's now 43. He has spent the last four years with his health being in a declining state and we have been attempting, especially since the COVID, to get him uh, released. He has been taken to the hospital and diagnosed as positive for COVID-19. They would wake him up at uh, like three o'clock in the morning, take him to court. He doesn't come back from court until eight and nine o'clock at night. And with being gone all day, he's placed in a cell with his hands and legs shackled together. He already can't move from the waist down. And yet he can't even shift his weight nor take care of his own personal hygiene because of the way they treat him in jail. So we are very concerned about him, about anybody that has any other type of disability about those young men and women who have families where they can go home to help to take care of or be taken care of by their families. And for whatever reason, our system just is not listening. My name is Kaleem Nazim, and my incarceration at the age of 17 wasn't due to a lack of guidance or mores from my family or loved ones, that people in low-income communities are not criminals, yeah. but a crime has been perpetrated against them, yeah. and that crime is called poverty. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. I never stole or committed a crime because I have a propensity to commit crimes. I did it because either I needed something or I was hungry. When I was nine years old, my mother was locked up in, for food stamp fraud, fraud. And that left me and my other five siblings alone in the house to fend for ourselves. Now the state knew that she was a single mother. But they found that locking her up was justice. 
But I feel and I know that the crime that was perpetrated against my mother and my family was way worse than what they say she did. Yeah. Me llamo Alex y soy de Guatemala. I'm Alex, I'm from Guatemala. Um, les quiero platicar lo que todos los inmigrantes pasamos en el, en el centro de detención. I want to tell you what all immigrants go through in detention centers. En el, de, en el centro de detención cuando estábamos todos los inmigrantes no, no nos no nos daban, nos trataron mal. It, no. At the detention center where, where I was with other immigrants, they uh, didn't treat us well. De comida, un burrito, helado nos daban y no nos dejaban bañar. They gave us a frozen burrito to eat and they didn't allow us to take a shower. No, no somos animales para que nos traten así a todos los inmigrantes. We are not animals to be treated like that. This is why we demand an end to mass incarceration. Voting rights for those who are incarcerated. We demand equality and safety for all. We demand education, housing, and living wage jobs. I need your help. It has to stop, and it has to stop now. This is why we're changing the narrative. And we won't be silent anymore. The military budget is over $738 billion, and majority of it is going to military contractors. Just one of those military contracts could pay to expand Medicaid in 14 states. Did you know that 54 cents of every discretionary federal dollar goes to the military, and only 15 cents goes to anti-poverty programs? It's time to change all that. Let's hear from the front lines of this crisis. My name is Chris Overfeld, and I'm with Veterans for Peace. Uh, I was a hydraulics mechanic in the Air Force National Guard, and it is no secret that there's always enough money for a bigger military and more jails, but never enough for education and the poor. When I joined the military, I had no idea that the United States military has over 1,000 bases worldwide. Why do we keep such a strong presence throughout the world? The short answer is to provide Western capital with continuous access to foreign resources and markets. Most of the military budget is used not to fight wars, but to exercise soft power in the support of American capital. Uh. Instead of a deployed military ensuring the wealth transfer continues, we have a deployed police force that protects the wealthy from the poor. When I joined the military, I had no idea that the best way to end American militarism abroad is to end it here in our community. There are four ways to do this. End the occupation of our minority community by the police. End the war on drugs. Provide access to health care and education to all people. And end the war on immigrants by defunding ICE and the Border Patrol. We will not get rid of our problems by bombing them away by shipping them away, by throwing them behind bars. According to the Department of Defense, for the fiscal year 2017, we spent $606 billion on the Department of Defense. 2019, we spent $685 billion. And for the year 2020, they're proposing $718 billion. To put this in perspective, for the year 2020, the Department of Education is only getting 9.9% .9 of that amount. I'm Reverend Shauna Foster, and I am representing veterans with about face veterans against the war. You get promises with the military industrial complex that we have to spend on defense for our own security. But after 16 years of war, 1.2 million civilian deaths and 10 million refugees, is anybody more secure? No. no. Most of the national budget is for war, and most of that money is given to private corporations, not to a publicly owned and accountable military, and not to the poor people who make up the majority of the three million veterans who have served in these last wars. These wars, they 
they serve no moral purpose and no economic benefit. Right. And military members are forced to carry out the spiritual death of this nation. Mama. But the spirit will not die because veterans and poor people across the land, we are a resurrection people. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The Pentagon budget is more than what the government spends on agriculture, education, environment, diplomacy, housing, science, and veterans combined. This is why we demand that we stop the privatization of military spending and military spending increases. We demand the reallocation of resources to social security. We demand the demilitarization of the border and local communities. And that's why I'm a part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival. We won't be silent anymore. Police brutality is something that's lived deep within our country for such a long time. The only thing that's different now is that we can't ignore the call. We here because they are taking black lives and they getting away with it. When folks ask black people in America, are we upset? The answer is yes. There's literally no way that all lives can matter in a country where black lives have never mattered. Living in America is a constant state of mourning. Until we fully address the poisonous root of this country and the original sins of this country, there will be mourning every day. Go, go! Being out in the streets, it feels revolutionary. With this amplified police presence, it's uh, terrifying. We were tear gassed, we were pepper sprayed, and many were shot with rubber bullets. And in the midst of all of that, protesters still standing with their hands up, saying, don't shoot. We all know this is exactly the type of situation that these systems are meant to break. Yo, they almost hit a kid, man! They are meant to break us before we can even become unified, so it adds a sense of urgency to the importance of organizing. This don't stop here. We can't ease up. The front that we present has to be an intersectional front because it is a war that's affecting all of us. And we have to recognize that we are so much stronger together than we are divided. These uprisings are going to continue to happen until we have built and fought for a, co a government in a country that treats people with human dignity, that provides for food, housing, health care, education, jobs, and an ability for people to live lives worthy of meaning and dignity in this country. Um, that's why I'm a part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, because this is the way that we're going to do it. Organization is the only way to build the world that we deserve, the world that we have already earn the world that our descendants and our children can be proud of. Did you know because of the Department of Defense's 1033 program, excess military equipment like tanks, grenade launchers, and other weapons of war are being sent to law enforcement agencies? Did you know that over 36,000 people die from gun violence every single year, including 2,800 children? Did you know that border immigration enforcement spending has increased by 900% over the past 40 years with 11 times as many deportations during that time frame? My name is Claudia de la Cruz and I'm an organizer, a theologian, and a mother. And as someone who was born and raised in the poorest congressional district, in the United States, which is the South Bronx, and has witnessed firsthand the brutality and the terror that is inflicted by the state through its police department, um, there, there is no other option than walking and working on the side of justice. I think mothers, um, and I can speak to as a mom of, of a black boy, um, who is growing up in, in this country, in this society, that when George Floyd was killed, 
there was a call that he made and he called for his mom, you know, and I think most mothers who saw that clip of those eight minutes and 46 seconds when the life was being taken out of this man and heard him call for his mom, heard our own children call for us. And so when we're talking about decisive moments, this is the moment. No police should be walking around with military equipment. No police department should have tear gases or rubber bullets um, or tanks. You know, it's ludicrous, it's crazy. And only in a crazy society would we accept that as the norm. This country has invested in death and has refused to invest in life-giving projects. And enough is enough. I think the people of this country are clear and are taking the streets and will continue to take the streets for as long as the demands are met and the vision isn't achieved. Uh, my name is Hakeem Ali. I came home in 2003 after serving 40 years in state and federal institutions. I walked the yard with a whole lot of men who were serving death by incarceration. When I was 15 years old, here in the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia Finest decided that I couldn't be out after curfew, so two very, very large red hair police officers cornered me on 60th Street in West Philly. I was about three blocks from my home. I'm a young guy. I'm from the street. And when they approached me, I didn't know who they were. Lights was all in my eyes, and I tried to defend myself. And they beat me to a bloody pulp right there on 60th Street. They almost killed me in the street. We demand a ban on assault rifles and easy access to firearms. We demand the demilitarization of our border and our communities. This is why we're changing the narrative. We won't be silent anymore. Hi, my name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. I am the director of the Kairos Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary and the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. I'm a Presbyterian minister, a biblical scholar, an activist for justice and jubilee, and someone who has had firsthand experience with poverty. For far too long, the poor, immigrants, victims of racist police violence, young people have been blamed for all of society's problems. For too long, we have been divided by race and immigration status, religion, issue era, sexuality, and gender. For far too long, we have been fed the lie of scarcity when we live in a world of abundance, where the only scarcity we have is the political will to establish justice, promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty and justice for absolutely all. For far too long, the false narrative of religious nationalism has blessed what is wrong and condemned what is right in the eyes of God. It is wrong for black people to be murdered by the police, for people to be ripped from their families and deported. It is wrong for people to work for starvation wages. It is wrong to go to war. It is wrong to poison children with lead. It is wrong for the powerful to deny responsibility for these injustices. What is right is to feed people, give people health care, secure the right to vote, respect all work with dignity, to forgive debts, to offer a home for everyone. We, as a nation, as a movement, must break through the lie that only small changes on one issue at a time are possible. We must break through the lie that poverty and death are the will of God or that poverty has to be with us always. 
We must break through the lie that some lives are more precious than others, that it's impossible to unite and organize for change, or that the rich and powerful are coming to save us. When we cry out, when we organize from the grassroots, when we take bold action together, it can be done. Si se puede. We join prophets throughout the ages who have declared to society that ignoring the poor, protecting the rich is evil, that the people demand justice, and we're going to build the power to achieve it with God on our side. The prophet Micah asks, what does the Lord demand of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. The book of Leviticus demands that we welcome the immigrant stranger. Deuteronomy, that nations forgive debts, outlaw slavery, pay people what they deserve. Isaiah demands that we stop passing laws that deprive the poor of their rights. Jeremiah, that the wealthy stop evicting people, stop profiting from pandemic, making misery for the poor. John the Baptist demands that the military and ruling authorities and police stop killing the people, stop exhorting money, and stop spreading lies about each other. Matthew demands that religious leaders stop covering up for those who divide. Instead, take the side of the poor, the side of the bruised, rejected, and battered. Jesus turns over tables, engages in holy disruption, commits himself even unto death to demand justice for us all. These Freedom fighters remind us that movements don't just curse the darkness. We don't just awake the nation to what is wrong, but we come together in power with demands. We reject the false narrative that poverty is inevitable, that if God wanted to end poverty, he would have already done so, or that the only time we'll all have what we need to thrive in this society is after we die. We instead rise together. We demand justice and will do so until we claim all of our rights. We in the Poor People's Campaign have a moral agenda and today we released a moral justice jubilee policy platform. It demands health care jobs that pay a living wage, a guaranteed adequate income, immigrant rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, an end to police and policy violence. Indeed, if we cut our military and make this nation and world safer, if we have a fair taxation system where those who can afford it pay just a little bit more, if we forgive debts and invest in health care and education and housing and living wage jobs, we can indeed abolish poverty, confront systemic racism, save the planet, and turn this war economy into a peace economy. We want to ask you all today to join with the Poor People's Campaign a national call for moral revival. To do so, please text MORAL to 90975. You are needed in this mighty, holy uprising. A nonviolent, an intergenerational, a multiracial army of the poor and all of those who care for justice is challenging this false moral narrative. We're building power among the 140 million poor people, low-income people, people on the edge of precarity and despair. And we're rising up for truth and justice and love.
May peace and blessings be upon you. My name is Linda Sarsour. I was one of the national co-chairs for the Women's March on Washington. I come here as a Muslim because my faith teaches me that I must stand with the most vulnerable people in my society. My God doesn't just tell me to go pray in the mosque. This act that we're doing today is an act of worship because my God is a practical God. So I'm here today to tell you that you can count on us communities, Muslim communities, women across the country who have joined the Poor People's Campaign at state capitals, that we will not be silent, That's right. that we will be unapologetic, That's right. and that we are willing to put our lives on the line for the most marginalized people in our society. I'm Rabbi Sharon Browse from Ikar in Los Angeles, and I stand here today representing millions of Jewish people around the country, some here in this place and many in state capitals across the country. The oldest and the boldest formula for economic justice comes straight out of the Hebrew Bible. In the 50th year, the Jubilee year, the great shofar is sounded and two things happen. All of the slaves are freed and all property reverts back to its original owners. This is a holy reset button that is pressed. It is a sweeping and a revolutionary act of economic redress that is rooted in the assumption that in a just society there can be no permanent class of poor, that the destitute, the exploited, the downtrodden deserve a fair shot and they deserve their fair share. And most astonishingly, overturning those economic systems benefits not only the enslaved and the poor, it actually saves the society from breaking, proclaim liberty throughout the land for all of its inhabitants. 50 years after the assassination of Dr. King, we declare a jubilee. We lift our voices for justice. We put our bodies on the line for mercy. And together, we will proclaim liberty throughout the land. I want to salute the great legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, and all of those who came together to ensure that poor people would be at the center of our social vision, at the center of our analysis of power, at the center of our hearts, minds, and souls. I salute Sister Liz and Brother Barbara for what they are doing. I'm there in spirit. Let the enactment and embodiment of the legacy of bringing all of us together, the rich legacies of Dorothy Day, our vanilla Catholic sister, and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, our dear Jewish brother, and Grace Boggs, our Asian sister, and indigenous people, Russell Means and others, the labor movement, religious folk, be they Hindu, be they Jewish, be they Catholic, be they Protestant, be they Buddhists like bell hooks, all of us together focusing on the precious humanity of poor and working class brothers and sisters made in the image and likeness of a God that we serve and will be faithful unto death. Let us come together. Let us be together. Let us struggle together. Let us continue to fight together. This Poor People's Campaign is a light in a moment of darkness. It exemplifies a love in a moment of hate. I'm there with you in spirit. Right on. We call to you from all corners of this nation. We are the Poor People's Campaign. A national call for moral revival. And we are here because somebody is hurting our people. Somebody's killing our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. Today and every day. We are called to be a movement. We unite. We side with the poor. We are the poor. We are the 140 million. We are people of crisis and of faith. Poor folks know how to find love and joy and hope in desperate times. Know how to dare to struggle in perilous times, which these are. These times require a poor people's campaign and a national call for moral revival. To fight the interlocking evils of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and a war economy. 
and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. Our backs are against the wall. We've got no choice but to push. Langston Hughes spoke for us. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. America must be. America's gotta be. America will be made new with a movement from the bottom up. If you step up, you right here in this room, you bring your gift, your poverty, your good fortune, your hearts and minds and voices and bodies, your time and talents, your stories and courage. A new nation is possible. A new world is possible. Across the nation, people are losing their fear. There's no going back now. We don't want to go back to normal. Normal? Normal in America got George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and Tony McDade murdered. Normal in America got us racist voter suppression and gerrymandering. Normal in America it got us 140 million poor and low income people in the richest nation in history. Normal in America it got us 700 people dying a day from poverty before the pandemic. For ourselves, for our families, for our children's children's children. We say today and every day forward together, not one step back. Join us. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are called to be a movement, and we won't be silent anymore. What happens in Wall Street often doesn't say a thing about what's happening on the real streets of America. Everybody! Everybody! Has a right! Has a right! To live! To live! The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival has come up with a series of demands. I know that you are here for the same reason we all are here, to put our elected official on notice. Yeah. The pain and the discontent is real, and the demands of our movement are moral. We know what we want to focus on. Our agenda is clear. We demand an immediate implementation of federal and state living wage laws. We demand, we demand the right for all workers, right for all workers to, form and join unions. to form and join unions. We demand, we demand equal, pay equal pay for equal work. For equal work. We, demand we demand a guaranteed annual income. We demand fully funded anti-poverty programs that protects the welfare of us all. We demand the expansion of Medicaid in every state. We want single-payer university health care, not for some, but for everybody. of the Voting Rights Act. We demand an end to racist gerrymandering. We want early registration of 17 and 18 year olds. We want registration to vote at age 18. If we can be drafted for war at 18, we ought to be able to vote automatically at 18. Early voting in every state, same day registration, and the enactment of election day as a holiday. We demand a reversal of state laws that prevent municipalities from raising minimum wage. We demand an end to mass incarceration and the continuing inequalities of black, brown, and poor white people with the criminal justice system. We demand the right to vote for the formerly incarcerated. Yeah. A clear and just immigration system. This includes providing a timely citizenship process that guarantees the right to vote. Yeah. The First Nation, Native American, and Alaskan Native people retain their tribal recognition as a nation, not a race. We demand, we demand decent, decent housing. housing. We demand, we demand relief from crushing household student and consumer debt. We demand equity in education. We demand an end to the resegregation of schools. We demand free tuition at public colleges and universities, and an end to profiteering on student debt. Yeah, Equitable funding for historically black colleges and universities. 
We demand the repeal of the 2017 federal tax law. And we demand that the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. We demand an end to military aggression and warmongering. We demand a stop to privatization of military budget and any increase in military spending. We demand a ban on assault rifles and a ban on the easy access of firearms. We demand an end to federal programs that send military equipment into local and state communities. We demand that the call to build a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border be ceased. We demand a ban on fracking mountaintop removal, coal mining, coal ash ponds, and offshore drilling. We demand a ban on all new pipelines, refineries, and coal, oil, and gas export terminals. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. Somebody's hurting my brother, somebody's hurting our sisters, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. We believe, we believe that we can win. We believe that we can win. We believe that everybody, everybody, has a right, has a right, has a right to live.
So we give honor to God today. You have heard from the prophets and the people on the front lines. We promised that this stage would be built so that America would have to hear herself and see herself, see her face and hear her voice. We must change this narrative and change this reality. I want to take a moment and also honor in their absence because they could not be here due to the COVID and all this happening. The mayor of the original Poor People's Camp, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and the policy director who works for the Children's Defense Front, Mary Wright Elderman, the founder. It's time for transformation, reconstruction, and revival in America. Two years ago, we were together on the National Mall, Liz, and in Washington, D.C., and over 25,000 of us from every corner of this nation walked in a solemn procession to the steps of the U.S. Capitol to declare that we were relaunching the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, with our eye on the reconstruction movement of the 19th century and the Poor People's Campaign a half century earlier in the 20th century. We did not pledge to sit in or camp out on the National Mall, but to go home to Alabama and Alaska, to California and the Carolinas, to Mississippi and to Maine, we went back to build a movement, permanently organized communities of people from every race, creed, and culture, and sexuality, who are ready now to rise up together and shift the moral narrative in this nation. We did not know then all that would transpire in this nation and in this world, but we sang a pledge to one another, Dr. Petty and Dr. Jackson, somebody's been hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. We committed to do more, mobilizing together, organizing together, registering together, educating together, people for the movement who vote, and to educate this nation together on the long train of abuses which had persuaded us that now is the time for transformative change. Frederick Douglass famously said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will, and that's true, but Brittany Cooper's recent book, Eloquent Rage, adds a crucial point. Power concedes nothing without an organized demand. Today, we have seen the faces of poverty and we've heard the cries of America's poor. We did not know that this mass gathering would happen amidst weeks of a public mourning and cries for racial justice in our streets. We had planned to be on Pennsylvania Avenue right in front of the White House before the pandemic hit. But we know that there are plans that are higher than our plans. And there is a timing that supersedes our time, it's kairos. And in the long arc of human history, there are moments when the universe itself groans and declares it's time. In the scriptures, there is a text where Jesus takes up the ancient prophet Isaiah and declares, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the oppressed, healing to the brokenhearted, and proclaim to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When Jesus read those words at the synagogue in the ghetto of Nazareth, it wasn't the first time the prophet's message had been proclaimed to the people, but Jesus came along at just the right time and said it's time. And we've gathered together to say it's time, America. It's past time. 
and we were born at the right time, and we are rising together at the right time. Each person with us today, each person hearing the voices of the poor and pushed aside today, each of you must know that this may be the reason why you were born. Now might be the very moment that called you into being. Fearsome and illegitimate power and a malignant river of money are attempting to face down what remains of American democracy. What we have is people power, and that is the force that will prevail. And each of you are irreplaceable part of gathering and exercising our rights. You have waited long for this moment. The ancestors have waited long for this moment. And in this fateful hour, your time has finally come. When we look back to the text of this nation's founding documents, we find these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. The Declaration of Independence begins trumpeting equality and its promises of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness for all people. And even though these words were written by a slaveholder and did not match the social contradictions he and others accepted, the spirit of the universe wrote in, wrote in a repeal clause because it goes on to say to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their power from the consent of the governed and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. It's right there in the text. When a long train of abuses demonstrates that a government has become destructive, it is our right and our duty to throw off such government. When we think about all we have heard today in a nation that makes such lofty promises but has accepted such abysmal realities, we must say, after such a long train of abuses, it's time. It's time for a moral revival. It's time for radical transformation and reconstruction. It's time to remake the systems of our common life and to make sure they serve everyone. America, at this mass poor people's assembly, you have heard dozens of witnesses testify to a long train of abuses. What begun as genocidal violence against native and indigenous people and chattel slavery imposed upon black bodies has continued for 400 years in policies and practices that have served the rich and the powerful while they have kept nearly half of us from having what we need to survive in the richest nation in the history of the world. 140 million Americans are poor and low income, 43% of the nation, and will be 50% before this pandemic is over. 700 people die every day from poverty and low wealth, quarter million a year and rising. We know it does not have to be this way. It can be altered. A new and better government can be instituted. We know what policies and public commitments are needed to address poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, denial of health care, and the war economy. And we know we have the resources to do it now. Now is the time. This is the place. And we are the people. Now, this isn't about conservative versus liberal. That's too puny. This isn't about left versus right, Liz. That's too puny. It's really about life versus death. Yes, on camera, we have witnessed terrible, murderous instances of police violence. But today, through all of these voices, you have seen how socio-political violence has also gripped millions through the interlocking injustices of American inequality. We never see this reality on camera, but it has snuffed the life out of untold thousands whom we hold in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits. Over a half a century ago, and we don't often talk about this side of Dr. King, Dr. King said, in our society, it is murder to deprive a person of a job or income. Now millions of people are being strangled that way. Millions of people have been crying, I can't breathe far too long this nation has refused to hear them. 
And now the COVID crisis has exposed for all to see the fissures and the wounds caused by systemic racism and poverty in this society. So we are here today to say together, it's time to choose life, America. It's time for us to do it together. It's time for a moral revolution of values. We can't pretend that the crisis we face is about a single individual in office or one political party alone. Sure, we're clear about what's being exacerbated, but even the current occupant of the, pre of the White House benefited from a culture that had been cultivated ever since the death of Dr. King and even before. We know it's not just what the president's doing, but what a regressive Senate, what a regressive Congress does. Far too long, our public leadership has been too comfortable with other folks' death. Truth of the matter is, Republicans racialize death and too many Democrats racialize poverty and too many Democrats run from poverty. It's time to say every piece of public policy has a death measurement on the down low. We don't talk about that often, but every piece of public policy, regressive, regressive piece of public policy has a death measurement on the down low. And it's been kept on the down low, but it's time to expose it now. Denying living wages and basic income has a death measurement. Denying health care has a death measurement. Uh, my son, William III, told me that 3,000 people die from particulate air pollution that comes from politicians protecting corporate polluters. When you protect corporate polluters, it has a death measurement. And it's time, it's past time, to reject the culture of death. Even racist voter suppression has a death measurement because when racist voter suppression is used to help people get elected, who once they get elected, they block health care, they block living wages, and they protect greedy corporations, then voter suppression is used in a way that produces a death measurement. And like the prophet Ezekiel said in scripture, it's not only the politicians who've been acting as ravenous wolves, that's the biblical language, it's also the lying religionists who cover up for them and it's time to reject and alter the policies of greed, violence, and racism that hurt, harm, and destroy lives. As Roz Pellis like to say, we need an analysis. Yeah. It's time to embrace an agenda rooted in the deepest values of our faith traditions, our highest and best political and intellectual visions, the values closest to the heart within each of us, love, justice, mercy, and truth, it's time to demand that we, the people, live up to our stated commitment to establish justice, promote the general welfare, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and guarantee every American equal protection under the law. It's time. In fact, it's past time. But also it's time for a major transformation and reconstruction. In recent weeks, we've heard the media ask, when will the protest stop? Since we've launched this campaign, people have asked, what one demand is your top priority? Well, we say, when you decided to do COVID response, you gave two and a half trillion dollars, nearly three trillion dollars to the banks and the corporation. If they can have three trillion things, don't ask us, what is our one thing? We are not asking for one thing. We are demanding that this nation reconstruct everything. We are demanding that for the sake of the people who would choose policies of life, liberation, and love. In this campaign, we know things don't have to be kept the way they are. We know that. We know that if we instituted fair elections and restricted the influence of big money in our politics, we could transition to automatic online voter registration and give life to our democracy by ensuring eligible voters can vote. We don't have to choose death, we can choose life. We need to understand that many of the things we are seeing don't have to be. They are bad choices. People in line now trying to get food, bad choices. People without health care comes from bad choices. 
uh, people without sick leave and basic and decent unemployment because of bad choices. Money going to the corporations in the middle of the pandemic rather than going to the communities. Bad choices. And if we change, we, the nation can change. If we want to have a hero's bill, yes, make sure there's money in there for city and municipal workers so we can save the jobs of public service workers, but also guarantee health care, but also guarantee living wages, but also guarantee sick leave, but also guarantee rent forgiveness, but also put a moratorium on people's utilities being cut off. We can do this and have life. If we instituted a $15 minimum wage immediately, we would raise pay for 49 million workers by $328 billion per year. 49 million people would come up out of poverty and low wealth. If we implemented a housing wage, we could raise pay for 83 million workers and by, by more than $1 trillion going into the economy. This would give life to our households and our economy. If we end mass incarceration, as Liz said, we could significantly reduce the $179 billion that currently goes to policing and courts and prison. And this would give life to our communities and raise resources to secure housing for all. If we stop pouring money and resources into a border wall, we could move that $24 billion into children's K-12 through education and give life to their dreams. If we canceled one military contract, we would have $25 billion to expand Medicaid in the 14 states that haven't already done so under the Affordable Care Act. This would mean life for millions of people in those states who are still uninsured in the midst of a pandemic. If we canceled another military contract, we would have more than enough resources to put towards expanding our water infrastructure and creating 945,000 jobs. Instead of putting those resources in war, we would support life because water is life. If we cut $350 billion from the military budget and close some of the 800 bases, we would still have more money than China and North Korea and Iran and Iraq combined. But we could make the world a more safer place and put those resources toward health care and lifting our people. If we had put $6.4 trillion that we've poured into endless wars since 9-11. If we had put that money into green energy, we would have built a renewable energy grid by now with nearly $2 trillion to spare. If we restore the corporate tax rate to what it was before the Trump tax cuts, we would raise $130 billion per year. This would be more than enough resources to fund the $100 billion we need to provide early child care and education for every child in this country. They could live. If we instituted a tiny tax on Wall Street trades, we would raise more than the $70 billion we need to invest in free public college for all. If we implemented a wealth tax on the richest households in the country, we would raise $270 billion a year to put toward fixing our public infrastructure. If we tax inherited wealth fairly, we could raise $78 billion a a year, and we could use that to close the racial wealth gap by ba putting baby bonds programs that would establish a savings account with resources for every American child. If we repented of the injustices against indigenous people and implemented fair policies for undocumented Americans and homeless Americans, we could change our present and our future and have a true healing from our past. Now, I know somebody's out there to say, well, did you get that from the Democrats? Did you get that from the progressives? No, got it from the Bible. Jesus said, Jesus said that every nation is going to be judged by how it treats the poor, how it treats the least of these, how it treats the sick and the hungry and in prison. Got it from the prophets of the Jew, that Jews, Muslims, and Christians honor. Isaiah 10 said, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. It's time. The worst mistake we could make now with all of this marching and protesting in the street would be to demand too little. And we have the capacity to change the political conversation in this country, and it's time. 23 million poor and low-income people who were eligible to vote in 2016 didn't vote. 
Many of them, they tell us because they never hear politicians talking about their issues. About 107,000 votes in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan decided the presidential election. In those sta three states alone, nearly 2 million poor and low-income people who did not vote in 2016 are eligible to register and vote in 2020 according to a forthcoming study we've done through, by, with Columbia University. In the South, 8.9 million poor and low wealth people who could have voted didn't vote, didn't vote. Why don't many of them vote? Because they say they never hear their issues of poverty. If we want to change the electorate, if we want to change the political calculus, we have to start talking to poor and low wealth people and stop lying on poor and low wealth people, yeah. white and black. Most poor and low wealth people did not vote for the current administration. Many of them did not vote because nobody comes and visits them and talks to them and listens to them and hears their stories and says in their policies how they're going to address the issue of poverty. We have the power to change the office holders. And then we have the power to get pressure on them, nonviolent, civil disobedient pressure if necessary, to push our agenda. We have power for in the streets, in the suites, in the voting booths, in the poor pits. We have power, nonviolent power, and it's time to use it. It's not only time, it's past time. It's our time. And when we come together and vote together and work together, we can change and remake the systems of government to serve all people. And then finally, it's time to move together and to refuse to be divided. Our mantra is somebody's been hurting our people and it's gone on far too long. We won't be silent anymore. It is a cry against the nation's long train of abuses rooted deeply in systemic racism and systemic poverty. When we say forward together, not one step back, Rob, it is a call to the kind of unity needed to answer the time we live in. It's the only thing that has ever revived the hope of a democracy. In every moment of potential reconstruction, there has been a moral fusion gathering. When poor white farmers and formerly enslaved voters realized it was time to form a fusion party across the South and to face down domestic terroristic, terrorist organizations and white supremacy campaigns, they were able, they were able to move together when multicultural coalitions decided it was time to come together in a labor movement after World War I. The corporate powers attacked them as socialists and used racist fear and political ideology because they were scared of people coming together. But in the 1920s, A. Philip Randolph and his friends and his allies organized a strike against the powerful Pullman Company and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Porters, Car Porters became the backbone of the civil rights in America for generations. In, in Flint, Michigan in 1937, the United Auto Workers took over factories and became a force to reckon with and a mighty labor movement was born. If you like the eight hour day and the weekend, you owe it to labor organizers who came together across racial lines. And when poor white folk decided it was time to join black folks and native nations, Chicano workers, the Poor People's Campaign 50 years ago was founded. And as we face a pandemic, we know America has a long history of dividing people, blaming Chinese or the Mexicans or Spanish or the Indians for disease in the past, scapegoating people by nationality. Mm -hmm. We know the tricks, yes, sir. but we also know when we decide it's time to unite, yes. oh, there's power. Yes, there's power when we come together. The truth is when you hold on to the truth, justice has never lost. During slavery, it looked like justice had lost, but when Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and some Quakers, Liz and white evangelicals decided it was time to get together, they formed this fusion movement that brought about abolition. Women didn't have the right to vote, but then Sojourner Truth and, and, and others decided it's time, Lucretia Mott, time, time, Mother Jones, it's time and they won the right to vote. Plessy versus Ferguson looked like it had the victory, but when Thurgood Marshall got white lawyers and black lawyers and Jewish lawyers and said, it's time, it's time to take on Plessy. They did it and they won. It looked like Jim Crow had beaten down injustice, couldn't rise again, but when Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, Bayard Rustin, who was gay, decided it was time to get with white folk like Glenn Smiley and Jonathan Daniels and Viola Wusso and James Reeb, when they got together, they tore Jim Crow down. And so we've come together today between Juneteenth 
and June 21st, yes. the summer solstice, to say it's time. it's time. It's time to be real free. Not just free, real free. And it's time to show some light in dark places. And that means each of us in this moment needs to take some inventory of our own time on this earth. Let me close here. I don't mean to be morbid, but in this pandemic, we must be honest about the fact that any one of us could be 48 hours from our last breath. I ask you today, if you knew your, you were going to take your last breath in 48 hours, what would you use your last breath to fight for? What kind of world would you want to breathe life into for the next generation? What would you use your last breaths for if you knew they were just a day or so away? Well, it's time to live like our last breath could come any moment. It's time to use every breath left in our bodies to fight for love and truth and justice. It's time to believe again. It's time to challenge the lie about not having resources. It's time to believe and work as though we are sure, we are sure that love is still greater than hate. The truth is still greater than lies. It's time to believe and work as though we are sure that the hungry can be fed, that the sick can be insured and cured, that immigrants can be welcomed, that the war machinery can be cut. It's time to believe that black and white and poor and Latino people in the South can be organized into a new powerful coalition for change. It's time. It's time to come together and vote like never before. It's time, whether you're black or brown or First Nation or Asian or, whatever, or, or, or Latino, whatever, whoever you are, gay or straight or trans, young or old, from the rural or from the cities, it's time to believe that this heart and the soul of this democracy can live. Yeah. We can breathe into it the spirit of a genuine yeah. democracy. It's time, yeah. even if it takes nonviolent resistance, it's time yeah. with every breath we have while we still have time. Yeah. It's time to rise up. It's time to reconstruct. It's yeah. time to call for a moral revival yeah. that, that puts an America together that works for us all. It's time. It's time as one songwriter said, to help somebody. Yeah. It's time That's to right. show this world that is traveling wrong, this nation that is traveling wrong. It's time yeah. to show some beauty to a world uproar. It's time. Yeah. This is why we're living. It's time to register. It's time to mobilize. It's time to educate. It's time. We are living in time for this time. It's time. It's time. It's time. It's time. Come on and join the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, and let's do something in time to change time because the time is right now. We are in one of those moments that demand a Poor People's Campaign. Our brothers and sisters are sleeping on the streets. For a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and it's wrong. When we throw away more food than it takes to feed every person, not just that's hungry in this country, but around the world, that is not right. Something is wrong. That is a moral emergency, and that's why we need a Poor People's Campaign. There's other systems here that are oppressing us that voting won't always fix and that we've got to talk about, we've got to call it out, and we've got to mobilize and build a movement to be able to change these things that our politicians won't always change. But if you don't recognize us, and then it goes back to that second chapter that we're the forgotten ones. Until we are ready to keep this fight going. Because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. Let the people vote! Yeah. When you hold down the poor, you hold down America. Our backs are against the wall, and we got no choice but to push. We are building a multiracial, intergenerational, nonviolent army of the poor that will break every chain. Every chain. And so we have to come to a point that every attack 
on the poor will embolden our agitation. Every attack on sick folk will embolden our agitation. Every attack on immigrants will embolden our agitation. We can do more. We can do better. It's movement time. It's time to shake this nation because this nation is locked up. Rise up. Rise up. Rise up. Get up tomorrow and start the revolution. God. 